Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfictions. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto was the the mythological master. Here is short summary. What if Naruto's family survived the ceiling, but saw Naruto as the demon? Now, Hades is tasked to helping Naruto by a contract made with his subordinate. Will this opportunity be his undoing, or will he show Konoha what they spurned? His new name? Naruto of Sparta. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. It was a dark night in the streets of Konoha. A short kid was walking back to the local brothel where the female workers let him stay. He had spiky blonde hair, eyes of the deepest blue, and three whisker-like marks on each cheek. He was dressed in an orange oversized shirt and some black basketball shorts. His name was Naruto. No surname. After all, his parents disowned him when he was three. He was hated for a reason unknown to him. Flashback. Minato had summoned the Shinigami to seal the Kayubi, but he knew he would lose his life. Suddenly, the unexpected happened. The Shinigami looked at him and spoke this child will have a difficult life. Human, I will offer you a deal. You will live but you must take care of this child. I wish him no harm. If anyone harms him and I find out you did nothing to stop them, I will come for your soul and he vanished. Minato breathed out in relief and fell unconscious. End flashback. Of course, the Shinigami never found out about his beatings. How could he when Minato blocked off the receptor in the Kyubi seal? Later, he was disowned by his parents at three. Flashback. Minato and Kashina looked at the young Naruto as he mopped and cleaned. It had been three years since the Kayubi was sealed and they started seeing him as the fox. Even if he was Naruto, he was no longer their son. They were snapped out of their thoughts when they heard something shattering. They turned to see Naruto picking up a cheap clay clown figure broken. It was then that Minato and Kashina had it. Damn demon. Can't do anything right. Minato yelled. Kashina simply picked Naruto up by his shirt and threw him out on the street, and it was then that they both screamed you're no child of ours. End flashback. After that, only a few people even bothered help him. Ayame and her father helped by feeding him and helping him when they could, yes. He remembered when he first met them. Flashback. A three-year-old Naruto was wandering down the street looking for something to eat. He was walking when he smelled a heavenly aroma. He followed it and it led him to a stand Ichiraku ramen, huh? Hugh walked in and saw a bowl with an intoxicating aroma. He also saw a girl. She looked about six years old and was wiping down the counter. When she wasn't looking, he grabbed the bowl and scarfed it down. It was then that he heard now for dinner he froze and looked backwards. She was behind him with a wooden spoon. He tried to pay, but it was then that two shinobi showed up and saw Naruto excuse me miss, but is this demon bothering you? They asked he's not a demon. Dot but he did eat my ramen without paying that was all they needed. They grabbed him and tossed him on the street. When he tried to run away, they pinned him arms and legs with kanais and started beating him. This went on for about half an hour until Ayame had a breakdown. She cried loudly and her father heard her. He came down and saw as the shinobi stabbed kanai into Naruto's stomach. What the hell are you doing to that kid? He yelled as he gently took Naruto down and helped put pressure on the bleeding following the Yandaimi Hokage's orders to finish what he started they exclaimed. Tuchi had enough and took Naruto inside. He helped heal what he could and set Naruto down. Ayame walked up to Naruto and cried. It wasn't until two days later he woke up to a sad Ayame by his bedside. I am sorry miss. I didn't mean to eat your ramen. I was just too hungry it's okay. I am sorry. This is all my fault. I shouldn't have said anything and you wouldn't have been beaten. It's okay miss, Ayame. Ayame Ichiraku it's okay Ayame Chan. I am sorry for making you cry. I don't like to see pretty girls cry. She smiled and Tucci opened the door. He saw her taking care of his pillows and bringing him ramen with a smile he hadn't seen since his wife was alive. He snuck his way into her heart, Tucci thought. End flashback. Ayame and him had gotten close. He knew he liked her but there were also others he liked. One was a ten-year-old Anko Mitarashi, who helped him when he was being beaten. Flashback. She had known pain and suffering, but this kid had it worse off than she did. 
She watched as the villagers beat him and tried to kill him. She couldn't take it anymore. She swooped in and took him off to the forest, where she patched him up as best as she could. He woke up and only said one word before blacking out. Tenshi he said. She blushed and carried him to her house. She helped him for two days and from then on helped him whenever she could. And on her birthday, she had gotten the only true present she had. She had gone to her door to leave and saw a bow there. She opened it and saw a note Happy Birthday Tenshi Chan Naruto in the box was a six packet instant ramen stock in a smaller box. She opened it and saw a pendant with a snake wrapped around a fox. The snake was pure crystal and the fox was pure dirty metal. For one of the lights in this world to me she read and smiled. End flashback. And the last person he met was one ten-year-old Hana in Azuka. Flashback Naruto was walking through the woods hiding out from the villagers when he heard whimpering. He looked to see two pups with blood on their sides and a rough-looking husky fighting off a wolf. He looked at the dogs and saw they were carrying a girl. He tried to get close, but they growled at him. He looked to see the husky being bitten. He threw himself at the wolf with a stick and started beating it. The wolf wouldn't care but it stuck him in a gash the husky made and dug itself inside. The wolf ran off and Naruto looked at the husky. All three dogs were hurt and so was their owner. He grabbed the girl and carried her back while the other two dogs carried the husky back. He followed them until they reached a huge compound. That was when a huge dog with an eye patch tackled him and bit his side. He yelled and dropped Hana as her mother, Sume, saw her daughter and her pups. She looked at Naruto and was about to attack when the triplets explained the situation. She took him in and healed him as well as Hana and the triplets. End flashback since then, he, Hana, Anko, and Ayame hung out often. Hana acted shy around him, but he didn't care, he had friends. They were there for him and supported him. He reminisced, unwittingly walking into a mob. This was the eve of his fourth birthday. He was ignorant of the danger until he felt a sharp pain on his leg. He looked to the mob and tried to run, but he couldn't. At the very least, he could take one of these bastards with him. He pulled out the kanai and threw it at a chunin, stabbing him through the eye. Little did he know this would trigger a massive chain of events. In the underworld Hades was busy directing traffic in the underworld when he saw a shinobi that wasn't meant to die until next week come in. He looked at him and called in his henchman, the Shinigami. He asked Shinny, old boy, why is this guy dead? He wasn't supposed to die till next week. Shinigami looked at the soul and then his clipboard. Apparently, this guy was part of a mob about to beat a child when the child fought back and took him out, sir. It was then that Hades' blood began to boil. Who was this child? He asked. Um, one Naruto, previously Naruto Uzumaki, Namikaze, that bastard. The Shinigami yelled and looked at Hades sir, that is the child of the contract. His, father, has failed him. Hades looked at him. He has. Hum, I guess I better pay back my debt then huh? He smirked come along. Shinny, we're gonna raise hell today the Shinigami shivered. Hell was coming and it wasn't gonna look pretty. In Konoha as Naruto was being beaten, Minato and Kashina sat on a nearby rooftop as the shinobi beat looked on, until a blue flame enveloped rose up and powered a Rasengan. The Kayubi is breaking out, he yelled as he rammed the Rasengan into where Naruto's body was. He paled when he heard a voice now, now Minato. That was mean. You would think the guy that let you stay alive would be welcome here. Minato paled and looked at where the voice was coming, seeing the Shinigami leaning back against a wall while watching the Rasengan go through Hades. Hades just stood there like it was nothing, then looked at him. He just pushed him off as where the wound would be there was nothing but smoke. He looked at Minato, his hair changing from cool blue flames to raging red flames now mortal. I remember I made a deal with you, you took care of the kid, and you lived. Well me and my assistant have been watching for the last five minutes, and you just sat there enjoying his suffering. Dot now why shouldn't I kill you? He screamed. Minato paled as Kashina appeared next to him. You want take him from me she yelled. Hades snapped his fingers as Minato started throwing up, a dark purple sphere falling from his mouth and going to Hades' hand off. A soul is such a fragile thing, he said as he crushed it, Minato went pale and his eyes rolled to the back of his head. Well, now to pay my debt to the child he said, when Kashina stepped in you want take him away, not my son Hades stared and laughed, 
He laughed loudly and looked at Kashina in the eye you disowned him and now you want him back. You're a pitiful excuse for a woman he said as he picked up Naruto when Anbu surrounded him for killing the Yandaimi Hokage, you will be sentenced to death but in a bright blue flash, Hades, the Shinigami, and Naruto were gone. Underworld Naruto was coming to, and slowly tried to get up. He looked around and saw stone cave walls, a weird river, and blue flames everywhere. He tried to get up but couldn't, he looked down to see a three-headed pup sleeping on top of him. He smiled and scratched the back of its head. Hey there guys. Can you help me get back home? He paused as he heard dark chuckling but Naruto, you won't be going home he looked around to see a man in a black toga with blue flames for hair and a grey complexion who are you Naruto asked why, Hades of course, death personified and alive, and my assistant, Shinigami he pointed up at the selling to a man clad in black eating an apple now, young Naruto, tell me, what do you want the most? Naruto looked at him and his face grew dark why do you want to know? He asked. Why, to help you achieve it of course he looked at him why? The Kyubi already talked to me, he said no one would love me or help me because I was him. The Shinigami looked at him and whistled when a five foot tall crow swooped down Naruto, meet my messengers of death. They can devour a soul and leave behind its energy. Dot now you have two souls. Dot how about this guy he patted the crow eats the Kyubi's soul and leaves you his power. See. See, could you really do that? Naruto asked of course. Now this might sting a bit he warned as the crow stuck his beak point blank on the seal and started pulling at it. Naruto felt his flesh being toppered apart, then a searing pain before he blacked out. He awoke five minutes later when the pup was licking his face. He looked to see Hades and Shinigami talking. They then turned their attention to him so Naruto Hades asked the bastard fox is gone, Shinny had a nice snack, and you're all better. How about now you tell me what you want? Naruto thought long and hard, when Ayame was crying over his beating, Anko saving him, and Hana being mauled by the wolf. He then came up with the answer. I want to be able to protect myself and those close to me, but I don't want it automatically. I'll work hard for it, it doesn't matter if I'm half dead. I'll be able to protect Hana Chan, Anko Chan, and Ayame Chan. He said enthusiastically. The Shinigami and Hades could only stare. Most kids would have asked for toys, and most men for riches. But not this kid. He asked for power, but for the right reasons, this kid was gonna go far someday. So you want to get stronger, huh? Well, I have an idea. There are a couple of souls that were killed before their time in their respective timelines and some potentially powerful allies. How would you like to go train with them? Then, all I ask is that you help them stay alive. I'll do it Hades Sama. Naruto yelled. See Shinny, old chap, that's how you show respect. Now tell me Naruto. Have you ever heard about the Spartans? He asked with an evil smile. Previously. See Shinny, old chap, that's how you show respect. Now tell me Naruto. Have you ever heard about the Spartans? He asked with an evil smile. Now. Naruto looked around the landscape he was in. Hades told him that he would be training with some legendary warriors first, the Spartans and their king, Leonidas. The Spartans weren't meant to die that day. They were meant to die later, it would seem. So Naruto's job was to keep them alive. Great. He had been adopted by Leonidas himself at an early age and been raised the Spartan way. His father, more than Minato anyway, had taught him how to fight until he was of age. He was then sent to the barracks to live and train with the other boys. He would only fight when he deemed it necessary though, which was whenever he was attacked or when his friends were attacked. He only had a couple of true friends, and they were all orphans. They took care of each other, watching each other's backs, helping each other when they were sick, and helping when one was hungry. Naruto was legendary at stealth by now. He would often steal food from the very kitchen and give it to the children that were starving. This earned him an automatic spot as their leader, but today was a hell of a day. Today he would be sent into the wilderness to fight a mountain wolf, one of the biggest and most ferocious monsters. This would prove if he was a man or not. He was now standing at the city gates with a spear in one hand and a shield in the other. Hmm. I guess I better go deeper into the mountains he thought as he climbed higher. He slowly walked into a cave and stopped to rest, but that was when he heard it. A loud growl, and three of quickly picked up a piece of burning wood and swung it at the dark, hitting a wolf on the face. 
He then grabbed his spear as the others started to close in on him. He smirked. Come on you bastards, he yelled as he thrust his spear forward, catching G1 on its hind legs and he slammed the shield into the other wolf's body. The final wolf thought the kill was open, but oh was it wrong. As it pounced on Naruto, canines aimed at the jugular, all he heard was a metallic ringing then nothing. Naruto had drawn his spare short dagger and swung it upwards, effectively slicing into the wolf's jugular. He then stabbed the wolf on his spear's end and killed the other two by beating them to death with his shield. He slowly started to skin them and curled up in the warmth of the furs. Now all he had to do was survive a month out here and he would be a full Spartan soldier, capable of taking on anything. One month later a 13-year-old man standing at 6 foot 5 inches walked towards Sparta's had a muscular build and a light blonde hair that was shoulders length long. He had a shield and spear strapped to his back. He wore a wolf pelt as makeshift pants and another one for a shirt. The last wolf part of him was his head, the upper mouth of a wolf torn apart and placed on his head. He estipped when he heard a familiar voice who are you and why do you come to Sparta? He grinned as he pulled out his shield and spear, a smile tugging at his lips don't you remember me anymore, dad? He asked. Leonidas looked closely only to recognize Naruto, his son. He smiled and quickly hugged his son. My boy, how have you been? How did the hunt go? He asked. It went well father. Bagged three mountain wolves and a chipmunk Leonidas stared in awe three. No one ever survives their second encounter with a mountain wolf, much less a third he said well call me surprising. I survived all three Naruto said as he pulled out a bag with three wolf heads. Leonidas smiled open the beer and bed the women. Tonight a new fighter joins our army, he yelled happily. At the festivities Naruto looked left and right as he walked down the street, wearing his beginner's armor as he drank beer. This was a special occasion and he was going to enjoy it. He had been drinking for a good hour when he heard a husky tone hey there stranger he turned and saw a beautiful black-haired, pale-skinned girl. She had deep hazel eyes and a sensuous pair of lips. He smiled as he saw her beautiful heart-shaped face start to speak well then, soldier. How about you and I get to, she sat down on his lap. Know each other better? He smirked and they talked. Her name was Cynthia. She was 14. Apparently, she wanted to be a soldier, but couldn't because she was a woman. But she was still a hell of a fighter. She had a lot of the same interests he had. Pranking, music, poetry, and all the same things. Her parents were killed when she was five, and when she asked him about his parents, all he could respond was they're dead to me. The evening progressed and as the festivities ended, he looked at her come on, I'll walk you home he said. He slowly took her to a nice apartment in the better side of Sparta. It was morning when Naruto was summoned by his captain. He left the woman's house as she kissed him and closed the door. He knew today would be the final battle, and he wouldn't be coming back. He put all of his battle gear into a pack and wore he a elite armor, same as 300, a pair of leather underwear, a red cape, his helmet, his sword, his shield, and his spear. He was ready for war. He arrived at a field to see the 300 warriors of legend. Leonidas would lead the army. His wife looked at him and said Spartan, come back with your shield, or on it. Leonidas smiled and led his army to intercept the arriving forces. At the camp in the pass they had arrived and set up camp. Leonidas had set up a command tent when he heard a request for an audience. He turned to see Naruto. Son, what is it that you need? Naruto looked at the map and saw the flaw that would be their downfall. Father, there is a pass here he pointed at the pass on the map with which the enemy could outmaneuver us. There is also a deformed Spartan living around here that can help us set traps around he stated calmly. As if on cue, a deformed Spartan looking thing came and requested an audience. He verified the information and Leonidas looked at Naruto, who nodded. Spartan. We will need you to go with some men to the craggy peaks in the pass to set up traps. Usually, underhanded techniques would not be necessary, but on this war they are. Leonidas said. The deformed man bowed and left with the fifty men to set up the traps. One day later the traps had been set up and the Spartans were ready for war. Six hundred reinforcements were sent from Sparta, making them a threatening force. As they were all sleeping, they heard yells of pain. They went to the peaks to observe the pass to see their traps working. Men who tried to cross the path OPN foot soon fell into a mixture of oil, rocks, and fire. 
It was twelve feet deep and sixty feet wide, covering everything. The flames raged on, the oil keeping them going no matter what. The warriors who tried to climb the peak soon slipped and fell into the artificial lava. The Spartans laughed as the cowards fell in, some supposedly the elites of the group. They were dressed in all black with silver masks that melted soon enough. Everyone but the night guards soon went back to sleep. Tomorrow would be a good day for war. The next day it was morning when the ships started unloading. The army of 20,000 warriors was facing off against 900 Spartans. Today would be hell for them. With Naruto Naruto was handing the archers wine bottles with rags stuck in them, to light the rags and then fire the bottles tied to arrows. It would help lessen the numbers and would be a good line of defense. Wartime all of the warriors were lined up at the front lines, the phalanx maneuver set as the archers took aim. The enemy army came at them, slowly marching. They held horrible monsters in chains while their leader, can't remember his name, so he's Bob for now, Bob was riding on an elephant, gold literally dripping off of him and a weird nose ring in his nose. He spoke up Spartans, you will be given one last chance to back down. Bow to me and fight for me, and I shall leave he announced. Leonidas laughed as he spoke you think we will bow to you? We bow to no one. This is an army of brothers who fight for their homelands. This is Sparta. He yelled as an archer took a shot. The aim was true the arrow went through Bob's head, killing him instantly. The warriors looked at their king as the wine bottle hit and set him ablaze. They stared in shock and attacked. War scene. The enemy army came at the Spartans, but the phalanx held strong. They then pushed their opponents back and broke, taking free rein into the enemy's army as the archers took their fire. With Naruto Naruto was slicing left and right with his spear, gashing enemy soldiers on their sides and chest. Anyone who got too close to him soon met the wrong end of his shield. As soon as the monsters were unleashed, Naruto hoisted his shield and threw it. It hit the kneecap of one of the monsters and he ran in faster. He sliced the other leg off the monster and beheaded it. It was then that he turned to see the second in command's son about to be beheaded. He ran in and looked up only to instead of feeling a blade at his throat, he felt a heat. He looked to see the rider on fire and an arrow through him. He silently thanked the archers and kept fighting. With Leonidas Leonidas was cutting through soldiers left and right, distinguishing between friend and foe. Friends were left to fight, foes were ruthlessly crushed. He looked up to see the son of his second in command about to be beheaded when Naruto stepped in and pushed him off. Naruto was about to be beheaded when an archer shot an arrow through the fighter and the fighter caught a blaze. He grinned and went back to fighting. None of the Spartans had taken casualties, but the death toll for the enemy was skyrocketing. He yelled an odd word and the Spartans retreated. They then waited for the fireworks to begin. Normal POV as a strange yell filled the air, hundreds of wine barrels and alcohols barrels were dropped from the peaks into the battlefield. They were then hit with flaming arrows that made them blow up. As soon as they did, various soldiers were taken out. Their numbers were soon few and they were picked off by the archers. Leonidas looked to see various ships retreating into the distance. But they were still firing arrows. One got close to him but he sidestepped instead of blocking with his shield. It was then that there was a loud painful yelp. He turned to see Naruto get hit by the arrow he sidestepped through the stomach. Leonidas grew grim as he saw Naruto's stomach acids coming through on both sides. He knew no matter what, Naruto was going to die. He kneeled and cried. He cried for his adopted son. They had won the war, but he lost someone close to him. Naruto Naruto was hit with one of the final arrows that Leonidas sidestepped. He fell backwards and was greeted by his father crying and the soldiers crowding around him. They looked at him, but could only mourn. It was when they removed his cape that they saw true damage. There were stab marks through him from enemy swords and broken arrow shards in his arms. They could only stare in shock. It was then that they remembered that whenever a killing blow would land on them, Naruto would attempt to deflect them. Keyword attempt since most of the wounds were on him. Here was a true Spartan. They could only look as one of their best was taken from them. His injuries should have taken him a while back, but he kept fighting. He was a true hero. Naruto then spoke up. Hey guys. What's with the sad faces? He asked. They looked at him when his father spoke up son, you are gravely injured, you will soon be in Hades' deathly embrace. He said gravely. 
Maruto somehow managed to grin a Spartan's greatest death is on the battlefield. Protecting their home and those they care for. This is a death worth dying. I am proud to die for you. I only have one request. Father, care for Cynthia. She is very special to me. Take care of her and anything she might need. It is my final request, he managed to sputter out with finality as the life left his eyes. He had done it. He had saved the innocents' lives. Sparta Naruto was brought back to the great city on his shield. His adoptive mother and father had cried their eyes out. They didn't have the heart to tell Cynthia the news. They would have to do it now. Leonidas was looking for Cynthia. He found her at one of Sparta's workshops. Cynthia, he said, a word about my son, shall we? He asked. She nodded and walked over to the Spartan king. How is Naruto? Is he okay? I heard your company made it back from the battle with no casualties, only wounds. Leonidas looked away and started Cynthia, Naruto is, no more. He has fallen in battle, he died an honorable death. He took various killing strikes for a variety of men. If he wasn't there, I can honestly and without a doubt say that we would have lost. He helped everything and everyone. There will be a memorial where his body shall be burned and me and my men shall recollect the fight. I am sorry for your loss, he said quietly. Cynthia was torn. Even though he was meant to be a one-night stand, he was all she could ask for. An orphan, but caring. Even though he was ruthless to his enemies, he was kind to everyone. She remembered him well. I will go to the funeral king Leonidas, she said. At the funeral IT was a grim occasion, today it was. The men were there to pay respects to the man that helped keep them alive and recollect the battle. After everyone had said their goodbyes, the army started recollecting their victory. They spun tales of the fights, each one saying how well Naruto fought and would watch their backs. The second in command would have lost his son had it not been for Naruto. But the most affected was Cynthia. After hearing of his exploits, she could honestly say she would have loved to be his wife. Especially now, she thought absent mindlessly as she caressed her stomach. This was not unnoticed by Leonidas who went to ask her are you all right my dear? No she replied. What is wrong? He asked worriedly. I'm pregnant with, with Naruto's child. She said. This was what shook the core of everyone at the party in the core of someone else's stomach far away. In the underworld Naruto had died in an unknown chapter in time, but only for a bit. Though his body was destroyed, his spirit lingered. He was with Hades planning his next training stop and watching his memorial when he heard it. I'm pregnant with, with Naruto's child. Those words shook him to the core. He looked over at Hades who only shook his head sadly. I'm sorry Naruto, but you know you can't go back. You're needed in your own time and place. But I will keep her under my protection, if you so wish it. And the child. I am sorry you have to experience such loss, but it is the way of the world. He said. Naruto was completely numb, but had to nod, he had to leave her behind, as much as it hurt his heart to see her hurt and pregnant alone, he knew his father would help her. His father was a man of his word, and a Spartan's final wish was law, no matter what. She would be fine. He slowly wiped away a tear, the last remaining proof of his childhood innocence. He then turned to Hades. Where next? Were the only words he said. Story start. A 15-year-old Naruto looked at a book in his hand. It was the only possession other than his weapons or training Hades had let him keep. It was a large book titled Naruto of Sparta. It was written by Cynthia of Sparta with help of King Leonidas of Sparta. IT held his great feats in the war and in the end there was a personal note from Cynthia and her life. She never married and devoted herself to raising Naruto's child, who was named after his father. She grew old, but not one day did she look back at what happened. She lived life to the fullest and didn't waste a day. At the end, there was also a note from his son, about how he wanted to be like his father when he grew older. How he would protect his precious people, no matter what. Both of them had been dead for a while, but it didn't matter. Naruto kept those two words at heart. He closed the book and went back to training. He had awakened in a Sparta 150 years in the future. There he would learn and save another one who went before his time because of a corrupt king. Achilles. Achilles had found him and seen a striking resemblance to the hero of legend. Due to that, he had taken Naruto under his wing. He taught him physics for trap making, hunting, scouting, 
battle tactics, and his own personal fighting style. Naruto also learned advanced Spartan maneuvers and more of the history of Sparta. Yes, Naruto would be Achilles' heir. He smiled, but then frowned. Naruto was already past his level, the kid worked like crazy. But soon he would have to go to Troy, where immortality awaited him. Naruto would also go with him, and his men, but that was it. The king would also send his army. But Achilles thought on Naruto, how the king had grown fat and corrupt and screwed Sparta over. Achilles knew he wanted more than this, but what? It didn't matter. They were closer to Troy, but would the end be worth it? Time skip. Troy's shores Achilles, Naruto, and his men had done it. They had taken Troy's shores, and also a temple of Apollo, the sun god. Just as Achilles was about to cut the head off a statue, he was stopped by Naruto. He looked at Naruto who replied we don't need gods trying to kill us do we? The thousands of men here will do fine. Achilles lowered his weapon as the king's son approached him. He grabbed his spear and threw it, hitting the man next to him. He smirked and walked inside silently, to collect the spoils of his victory. Naruto Naruto watched as a shrine maiden was taken off to the king against her will. He grabbed his sword and pointed it at a man's gut while he smashed the other man with his shield. Let her go. She is under mine and Achilles' protection. He exclaimed. They let her go and he escorted her back to Achilles' tent where she could wash up why did you help me? So I can be your whore. She spat out in disgust. He turned to her no you and Achilles are a lot alike. He too fights for the unknown and tries to find his place in the world, as do you, your highness, he said. She could only stare in shock at the truth of his words. Achilles Achilles watched as the army walked off to invade Troy. He decided against it because he knew they would fall. But he cared not. He walked to his tent to see Naruto and a shrine maiden there. Brother, who is she? He asked. Your new charge he replied as he walked off. Achilles looked at the girl and let her sleep when she spoke why do you fight? For immortality he replied. Immortality in battle and life he corrected. And who do you fight for? She asked. Myself. That man out there is no king of mine. He replied as they talked. Naruto watched amused as he walked off to get stone cold drunk. Today was the anniversary of his death, after all. Time skip. Months later. It had been months since the Spartans arrived in Troy. In that time, Naruto had been his usual aloof self and Achilles had gotten to know his new charge. That was when it happened. Naruto was walking through camp, wearing a jet black sculpted chest piece, his helmet, his leather underwear, and his battle gear, when the son of the king of Sparta tried to attack him. Naruto quickly reacted and withdrew his sword. What do you want Trojan? He asked. To kill Achilles of course the man replied as he drew his sword. Naruto took off his helmet and the man saw it. Cerulean eyes and sandy brown, tame hair. He looked a lot like Achilles, but it wasn't him. Naruto the moved in and thrusted his sword forward, catching, I can't remember his name, so now he is Bob, Bob's shoulder. Bob quickly parried and stabbed at Naruto. Naruto ducked and slammed his shield against Bob's shoulder. Bob was forced to drop his shield and in five seconds had a blade at his throat. Trojan. I now hold your life in my hands. If my brother did not love your cousin, you would be no more than a blood splatter on the ground. He signaled the men and Bob was hog tied and led to Achilles' chambers. Achilles' chambers Achilles had been attempting to soothe the girl after a guard arrived stating that the Trojan prince had been captured. She wept and wept for his fate. If the Spartan king had caught him, his fate would be sealed. So she was relieved when Naruto and the other men carried the Trojan prince in. Achilles looked at Naruto what is the meaning of this brother? Did you lead our men into battle without my approval? He asked as he unsheathed his sword. No brother. The prince thought it wise to kill you and avoid a major war, but came after me instead. Naruto said. Achilles laughed loudly. If he knew that you're the only one that has surpassed me in all ways, he'd have been dead. Achilles said. It was then that he turned and saw the girl tending to the hurt prince. He looked at the prince and spoke tell me Trojan prince, why do you seek to harm me? Have I not been lenient by keeping your cousin alive and well? By not participating in the battle against you earlier? The prince then decided to speak I came here to end a massive scale war, but ended up being caught. Kill me if you will, but know that others will rise up against you. 
Achilles thought long and hard. His heir had risen and he had a woman whom he would love to grow old with. His name would be remembered forever, but only in curses of Spartans and Trojans. There was one way out. One where he would gain immortality in Troy and his name would be immortalized in Troy. Praises would be sung in his name and by his descendant. He knew what he had to do. Rise Trojan. I will not kill you, but rather ask something of you. Everyone looked stunned while Naruto smirked. So time to retire, eh brother? Naruto thought. Me and my men will escort you back to the city of Troy and return you to your father. In return, I require something of you, Troy will never surrender. Bob yelled. Who said I wanted Troy? I want to fight for Troy. Unlike Sparta, Troy fights their own battles, and as hard as it would be to betray my home, the king has become corrupt and fat and lazy. I would never betray my home in the time of King Leonidas, but now Sparta is not worth saving. All I ask is asylum in Troy, to fight for Troy so my name will be remembered, and to be able to marry anyone that I might want, as long as it's consensual on both ends. The shrine maiden blushed at this and looked down. Bob noticed this. His cousin had never actually fallen for anyone, but now this was awkward. She fell for the enemy, and Troy would fall to the Spartans without Achilles' help. Fine. I accept your deal. As of now, you are under my protection. No one in Troy will attack you unless you attack first. If they attack first, you may defend yourself. Bob sighed. This would be hell to explain to his father. At Troy Trojans gathered together at the gates when they saw Achilles of Sparta escorting a lost shrine maiden and the prince back to Troy. When the guards attempted to attack Achilles' men, the prince stopped them, stating that Achilles and his men were under his protection. They made their way to the palace for an audience with the king. Time skip. After negotiations the king had agreed to everything when the shrine maiden and his son were brought back. Achilles would fight for Troy and wed his beloved after the battle. Achilles and his men were set up with the other men in the barracks. So was Naruto. Achilles and his men were officially Trojan soldiers. They still kept their armor, only had a different allegiance. A week later tonight was the night. The final battle would happen today. The Spartans had gained the Trojans trust quickly, making them brothers in arms. The ex-Spartans would lead the first wave along with the Trojans. Battle. Naruto as the first wave hit Naruto's team. They assembled the phalanx maneuver and held strong. After the Spartans were pushed back Naruto and his men broke and attacked forward. Naruto was running through the Spartans, swinging his spear left and right. He then spotted Achilles to the left, about to be impaled by a horse rider. Naruto hefted his shield and threw it, hitting the rider's horse, making it stumble before Achilles was hit. Naruto then unsheathed his sword and went on slamming his shield against various Spartans and stabbing through even more. He ducked left and right, slashing at arms, legs, and anything near him. He only avoided the Trojans and his own men. The battle was fierce and dragged trough hours, but Naruto held strong. He looked up to see Spartan archers fire at him. He lifted his shield and blocked them all, then ran his sword through the front of the shield, cutting the arrows off. He charged forward and kept going, slaughtering men left and right. Battle. Achilles Achilles slaughtered through troops left and right. It was when he knocked down a soldier that he froze. It was his cousin, a man that wanted to kill him was his cousin. As a horseman rode up behind him, he was about to be impaled. Achilles saw his grin and turned to see the horseman closing in. He stabbed his sword into his cousin's throat. If anything, he would take the traitor with him. It was then that he saw a spear go through the horse's foot, flipping it in the rider. Achilles turned to see his brother as he headed back to battle. It was then that he saw the Spartan king. He pulled the spear from the horse and took aim. He then threw it and he looked at the spear. It pierced the king's side and took him down. Achilles grinned and headed into battle, unaware of what was to come. Battle overview The Spartans fought back, but to no avail. With their king wounded, there was disorder and chaos everywhere. This made them easy to pick off for the Trojans. Along with Achilles in the battle, the Spartans knew there was no hope. It was then that their wounded king rose up, grabbed a bow and arrow, and took aim. His target. Achilles. If he was going down, he was taking Achilles with him, war be damned. A traitor to the crown, this would be worth it. He fired the arrow, but there was a factor he didn't count on. 
With Naruto Naruto saw the Spartan king took aim and saw his target was Achilles. He couldn't let Achilles die. It was his duty. And Achilles was the brother he never had. He ran to Achilles and pushed him out of the way, the arrow impaling Naruto on the gut. With Achilles Achilles was about to impale a soldier trough the heart when he was pushed off to the side. He turned to see Naruto on the ground, an arrow going through his armor and gut. He then turned to see the king of Sparta laughing at Naruto's misfortune, a bow in his hand. He knew what Naruto did, he took an arrow for Achilles. Achilles rushed off to the king and jumped in front of him, slashing into his arms and legs. He then grabbed arrows and crucified him on the floor. As the Spartan king whimpered in pain, he tried to negotiate for his life please. I'll give you women, gold, glory. Spare me, I beg of you. You ask for mercy, but you wouldn't have shown it to me or my brother, you ask for something you deny everyone. I will not give you mercy. I will rather send you to Hades' deathly embrace. Achilles said as he stabbed the king through the heart, killing him. As the army heard their king die, they could only drop their weapons in defeat. The Spartans had lost. Their king was dead. The battle was fought. And they had lost. Time skip. One month after the battle after the Spartans had lost and their dead were burned, the king of Troy took over Sparta. It was now a joint kingdom with Achilles being the Spartan king. The Spartan army of Achilles took heavy casualties, but most remained alive. The biggest casualty was Naruto, the apprentice of Achilles fell in battle saving his teacher. The memorial had been brief and Achilles set fire to his body. Afterwards, Achilles decided not to teach anyone other than his future children. He had married the shrine maiden, his one angel in this sin-filled world. He loved her with all his heart. He cared for her. And a week after the marriage, he got some news. She was pregnant with a boy. He decided to name him after his fallen apprentice, Naruto. As of right now, he finished writing the last line of his book, dedicated to his son and his fallen apprentice. The Legend of the Dark Death. A book detailing Naruto and Achilles' exploits. He smiled as his wife walked in to drag him home. Life was good for him. Underworld Naruto watched his teacher's life. He was proud that Achilles had lived and moved on. His son being named after him was a shock. He smiled as he looked at the far wall which Hades was standing besides. It held the armor and weapons he got from Leonidas and Achilles in glass cases. It also held the original manuscripts to both books written about Naruto. He grinned and looked at the Shinigami. Hey Shinny how's it going? The Shinigami smiled pretty good brat. Something tells me you'll meet someone, legendary next. The Shinigami said as Hades walked up to them. Naruto my old boy, how was Sparta? Good. Perfect. Now is the final travel you will do. Tell me, what do you know about the demigod Hercules? Hades asked. A 17-year-old Naruto looked at his latest teacher, the great Hercules and his teacher, Philoctetes. He had been here for two years now, training under them both. By now, he was built like a bodybuilder, with sandy blonde tame hair, like Achilles, blue eyes, wearing a tan metal armor that was a lot like Achilles except that it was tan and offered more protection. He held a shield that had the symbol of Mount Olympus and a sword. The sword would only add to his great exploits. Hercules had taught him a defensive sword style that focused on using your opponent's strength against them, trap making, battle tactics, philosophy, diplomacy, how to use the bow and arrow, and a spear style that used the entire spear and a shield as a death trap. Overall it was a good education. Naruto smiled as he saw Hercules and Megara talking. He was glad his teacher had found someone to love. It reminded him of Cynthia, but he quickly discarded the thought. He didn't think of his past, only how to improve on his future. He then realized that Hades would soon make his move on Mount Olympus. He was torn by this. He knew this was the Hades of the past, but was still torn. He didn't know who to fight for, dot for once, his loyalties were in question. Midnight in the Rose Garden Naruto was sitting in the middle of the Rose Garden in the Hercules estates when he heard a familiar voice something on your mind, Naruto? Hercules asked. Just wondering about what I should do, Naruto answered. Hercules looked at him wonderingly about what? He asked. In a battle, the most important thing is to remain loyal to your side, but if you don't know which side you belong to truly, then who do you listen to? Hercules thought about this, and smirked. That's an easy one. You told me the answer long ago. 
You answer to yourself and help protect the ones you care about, no matter the cost. Hercules replied. Naruto thought on this and it was true. He didn't know the Hades of this time and he did know Hercules. His father, the one who helped make him what he is today. Thanks Herc. You just helped me a whole lot. Naruto replied as he got up to leave, but was stopped. Wait Naruto, I have a present for you. Something me and Pegasus pitched in for. He said as he led Naruto to the stables. When Naruto arrived, he was surprised to see another horse with wings standing next to Pegasus. He looked at it and then at Hercules. Who is he? He is. Well I don't know, you have to name him. After all, he is your steed. He is the first of Pegasus' line and the best Phil has ever bred. Even faster than his own father. Hercules said as he petted the horse. It was a solid white horse with white wings, blue eyes, and a dark mane. The insides of its wings were also black. It looked at him and whinnied, then bowed its head as if accepting him. I think I will call it. Shinny why that? Hercules asked as he looked at the newly named horse. It's the name of an old friend. Good friend. He smiled as he took Shinny to his stable. He lay down on the hay next to the horse and fell asleep. Tomorrow would be a big day. That was the day Hades would have enough power to unleash the Titans during the eclipse, after all. The next day Naruto looked at Meg as she was crushed by the stone pillar. Today had started with a nice breakfast, then a quick shower, and finally doomsday along with the midday eclipse. Hades had unleashed the Titans and sent them on a crash course with MT. Olympus. He also sent a Cyclops and a moving twister to deal with Hercules. Hercules fought long and hard, but in the end the twister was too much as it slammed him into a wall. The Cyclops then moved to eat Hercules, but was suddenly stopped as Naruto riding Shinny shot a flaming arrow into its eye. It was then that the twister decided to get involved. Too bad it didn't notice that Hercules had grabbed it by the tail and slammed it into the ground by the Cyclops, sucking the one-eyed idiot in. He then threw it into the ocean, his aim true as they landed back in their prison as it closed. They thrashed and screamed to no avail. They were defeated. But their brethren would free them. Soon. With Hercules Hercules lifted the pillar and picked up Meg. He could only caress her face and whisper things she would never be able to hear. This was when his student grabbed him Hercules. There is still a way to get her back. Hades hasn't claimed her soul in the underworld. If we can get him to give it back, she can come back to life. Naruto exclaimed. Hercules looked and shook before nodding and looking at Phil. Keep an eye on her, we will be back. They said as they climbed on Pegasus and Shinny, respectively, and rode off. At Mount Olympus gods in chains were dragged around as pain and panic, two of Hades' servants, pushed them to the side. The titans were freezing, melting, crushing, and destroying the heavens. This was when they heard a loud war yell and two men on horses cut through the gods' chains. The brunette, Hercules, jumped and freed Zeus as the blonde freed the rest of the gods. It was this when the battle went askew. The gods fought back, Apollo on his chariot, Athena with her sword and shield, and the others with what they could. Naruto and Hercules could only watch as the gods fought back the titans into their prisons. Naruto saw the Cyclops was going to attack Hercules, crushing him with his fist, when he pushed him out of the way. The fist would have crushed Naruto had he not caught it. Apparently, all of his achievements and feats titled in with selflessly saving his teacher's two time had granted him godly status. He lifted the fist and pushed it back into the cage as he looked at the gods. Hercules was stunned as were the rest. But the other gods had already heard and witnessed his feats, they knew he earned this. This would grant him and any mate's immortality, both in name and actuality. He looked at his teacher and smiled. Let's go get Meg back from that pale bastard, huh? He asked and Hercules nodded. They both mounted their horses and rode off to the underworld. The underworld Hades was looking at the destruction and mayhem the titans were causing until he heard a loud growling, a whine, and his cave entrance was blasted in by Cerberus, the three-headed guard dog of hell. He looked to see Hercules and his flying horse on the middle head of the dog and another blonde coming in on an altered version of Pegasus. He looked to see Herc's fist meet his face, repeatedly. It was then that Hercules asked where is she? Herc, Herc, relax. You'll give yourself a heart attack. Hades replied. Let her go. Hercules replied come on, it'll give you a tour of the place. One crappy tour of the underworld later and this, 
he said pointing at a chasm is where all of the dead souls go Hercules looked and saw a phantasm version of Meg, he reached in and tried to grab her but couldn't. He looked at Hades and said you like making deals. Take me in her place. I don't know, Hades replied your rival's son in a chasm of death, going once, going twice. Fine, fine. Go get her. She goes. You stay Hades said. Hercules dived in and reached for Meg in an attempt to reach her. He aged years in the plasmic goop, already having reached his eighties. The sisters of fate were about to cut the wire of his life when it became golden, meaning. At the chamber a golden glow was seen at the edge and Hades started sputtering. But how? It can't be. That would mean he's a, 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 a god, he exclaimed as Hercules rose with Meg in his arms. He tried to negotiate but was punched into the wall as Hercules left. With Meg Hercules walked towards Meg and laid the spirit into her body. The body regained its shine and she woke up, as if dreaming. She smiled and looked at him wonder boy, dot but how? She asked. People do crazy things, when they're in love Hercules replied. She smiled and kissed him deeply as a thunderbolt hit their feet, along with Naruto's. It formed a cloud that carried them to the top of Mount Olympus. When they arrived, the gods could be seen cheering for Naruto and Hercules. That was when Zeus and Hera could be seen walking towards their son. Hercules smiled as he hugged them both. Mom, pops, he said as he hugged them both. Naruto stood to the side, smiling when he heard a voice that made chills go down his spine Naruto. It was the voice of. It was the voice of a woman, the first woman he ever cared for, even if briefly. He turned to see Shinny there with Cynthia's soul by his side. Shinny looked at Naruto and let out a ghost of a smile Hades decided to celebrate you becoming a god by letting you see your deceased lover one more time, for closure. He said as he disappeared. Naruto looked at Cynthia and hugged her close to him, not wanting to let go ever. Her black hair cascaded over his face as she kissed him and looked into his eyes, hazel meeting blue. He smiled and said I was afraid I'd never see you again. I wasn't she replied. She smiled and said I saw you every day in our sun. Same eyes, my hair, your personality, he was an exact replica of your personality. When I saw him, I saw you by his side, he became a great Spartan, just like his father. But enough of sadness, I just wanted to tell you that, I love you, Naruto. She said, he looked at her and smile and I love you, Cynthia. He replied, making her smile but that quickly faded. She looked at him and kissed him as she held him close to her. Our son, loved you with all of his heart. You were his idol, all of the men of your platoon respected you as their king, and your father named you a king before he stepped down. You went down in history as the people's king. You were beloved by all, she said as a tear ran down her cheek. I know, I read your book, and Cynthia, thank you for taking care of my son, it means the world to me. He smiled as he saw her fading. Her translucent hand caressed his cheek one last time before she faded away. I will always love you, Naruto. My love she whispered. He smiled and got up as the gods approached him. They looked at him suspiciously, but when his godly hue came upon his body, their eyes widened. A human had achieved godhood. This was never heard of. It wasn't until Hercules walked up to Naruto and asked who was that Naruto. He looked at them and smiled someone of my past he grinned as he took out a flask with a skull on the front he took out sake cups and filled them then passed them out to the gods the gods eyed them suspiciously until hearing in these cups are all of my memories hades himself made it for me not your hades but the one from my time if you want to know who that was drink up he said as he looked at his cup he swallowed it as he relived his memories all of the other gods, including Hercules and his newly pronounced wife, goddess, Meg, drank up. Within minutes, all of the gods and Hercules and Meg were shocked. They looked at Naruto as he looked at the heavens. All of them had tears in their eyes, not believing one person could live through that much hate, nor that Hades was nice. That was when Naruto walked up to Zeus. Oh Zeus, king of MT. Olympus, I have a favor to ask of you, he said humbly. Zeus nodded and listened the titans will get rowdy and attempt to overthrow you again. I ask they be placed under my care. I also ask a mark be made on my shoulder so I may summon them from their prison so they may fight in my name. 
that way, they will get occasional liberty and I get some powerful allies. What say you, Zeus? He asked. Normally, Zeus wouldn't allow this to anyone, not even himself. But he had seen the dimension Naruto had come from, battles fought on a daily basis for survival. Though Naruto was hated and beaten, he never fought back. He smiled through it all and gladly gave his life for those he deemed precious. This boy was special. Zeus nodded and a tattoo appeared on Naruto's shoulder. It was a circles with the kanjis for ice, earth, wind, lava, strength, and another kanji that read mythical. Naruto smiled and thanked Zeus, but asked one final question. Zeus, my time draws near. I ask what will happen to my wife, should I find one, since I am a god. Zeus looked at him and spoke she will become as immortal as you are. But remember, injuries can still take your life. And hers. Be happy Naruto and enjoy your life. Forge a better path than the one you were given. We will all keep an eye on you. Naruto nodded and thanked them as he faded away. From that day on, there were two new constellations. One was of Hercules and the other was the Spartan symbol. Naruto became known that day as the god of purity. Naruto reappeared in hell in his room. There was Shinny, the horse, Hades, and the other Shinny. His armor was on display along with all of his belongings. Naruto smiled and turned to Hades thank you, for letting me see her once more. He said. Hades smiled and nodded. He then turned to Shinny and started now it's the last leg of your training Naruto, when you return to your dimension and time, you will be 18. Now, normally I don't do this, but I decided Shinny here could train you in ninjutsu and how to dispel genjutsu. Kenjutsu and taijutsu you have in spades. He will also teach you all of the things you were deprived of. Now go on and get to work. He said as he ushered them away. Time skipped five years, I really don't feel like writing five years worth of training. An 18-year-old Naruto stood at the gates of hell, he was officially done with his training. Shinny had taught him some ninjutsu, but not much. The reason being because his connection to the gods and the titans threw off his balance. Instead, they worked on making a hybrid ninjutsu style. It was named Titan Style. It used the elements of the Titans and summoned them, such as magma, ice, wind, etc. Then Naruto channeled chakra into the element and did the same hand seals for some ninjutsu techniques. What made this new ninjutsu style dangerous was that he would have complete control of the element he summoned, no matter what. He developed many techniques this way, but his crowning achievement was his Titan's armor. Since he didn't have an army of Spartans for his training to be effective, he learned to make clones. Shadow, water, mud, and lightning clones were the most helpful ones. He also learned advanced trap making, politics, chemistry, biology, mechanics, and many other things from Shinny. The last couple of years had been brutal for him, but it was worth it. He was up to par with all of his old teachers in their prime. He was 6 foot 5 inches tall. His hair had changed to a sandy blonde and become tame. Think Achilles' hair, he had a build that matched an athletic runner's, but underneath those compressed muscles was power enough to rival Tsunade in her prime. He also figured out what the kanji for mythical on his shoulder did. Flashback a 14-year-old Naruto was practicing summoning the titans. He bit his thumb and swiped it across the kanji for lava, when some of the blood fell on the mythical kanji. Suddenly, the ground started to rumble as the three-headed demon, Cerberus, rushed in to aid Naruto. After he rushed in, magma started to shoot out of the ground as the titan of magma, don't know their specific names, was summoned. It was then that Naruto realized what the kanji did as he dispelled the magma titan and Cerberus. It allowed him to summon mythical creatures. Flashback end in the end, he had summoned Cerberus, the Gorgon sisters, the Kraken, Harpies, Sirens, Minotaurs, a lion, Hades soul extracting ravens, these will come in later, and oddly enough a flock of Pegasus. He had many allies to help, and all they asked was to be included in epic battles. The only ones that needed more were the Pegasus, they needed a human to bond with. Once bonded, they could stay in his plane of existence forever. Shinny had grown a lot. His appearance was the same, but his legs now had even more powerful muscles. He could run from Kumo to Suna in a day. His wings also grew stronger, now being able to maintain flight for three days straight. Naruto climbed on Shinny and looked at Hades and Shinigami. Even though he had had families, these would always be his fathers. 
They cared for him when no one else would, besides a select few people, cared for him, and trained him to be what he was. A Spartan and a god, he would never forget them, he bowed to them both. Hades Sama and Shinigami Sama, I can't thank you both enough. You both helped me from my hellish life and gave me a chance. I appreciate it and can't thank you enough for it, he said. Hades walked up to him and placed a hand on him Naruto, you're like the son I never had. You exceeded all expectations and made me proud, I am glad to have been called a father by you. Don't be a stranger and swing by every once in a while. I see your future, and it is bright, Hades said as he handed him two scrolls. Sealed in those scrolls are your original armors, I put seals on them so they adjust to fit you. And your books, the ones written by Cynthia, Leonidas, and Achilles. Make me proud, son he said as he hugged Naruto. Naruto smiled and hugged him back, then turned to Shinigami. Shinigami had a small box in his hand and Naruto's sword and shield, along with his spear. His sword was wider than usual and curved to a sharp point. Same sword as 300, it had the kanji for hell on it. The same was of his shield. It was a polish to a shine and had hell's gates on the front. He looked at Shinny you are like a brother to me Shinny. You helped me whenever you could, and for that I'm thankful. He said as he hugged Shinny, tears spilling from his eyes. Shinny smiled and spoke Naruto. These are some of the finest weapons forged in hell. They are made from adamantium, same metal as Wolverine's claws, a metal from before your time. Once set and shaped, it will not break, no matter what. Your sword is made of said material, as is your shield and spear. They can both be channeled chakra into. Wind, lighting, and water chakra will work fine. I also saw you as my brother, and I remember how excited you were when I first introduced you to music. So I got you this, he said as he opened a box. It had a jet black MP3 player in it and some jet black headphone. Under them were seals that stored spares. This is my own MP3 box. In them are your favorite songs. They have seals in them so they don't run out of power, fade, break, have unlimited space, and can't be destroyed. Same for the headphones. And don't be surprised if songs start appearing on it, I will send more songs into it when I can. Live a good life, brother. Make me proud, Shinny said. Naruto nodded as he donned his old armor from Achilles. He put on the jet black chest piece, back piece, leather breeches, and battle coverings. He then put on his shin guards and arm guards, he put on fingerless gloves that belonged to Achilles and donned his jet black helmet. He looked like a carbon copy of Achilles as he sheathed his sword on his side and strapped his shield on his back, his spear running through the shield. He smiled and waved goodbye as he climbed onto Shinny, the Pegasus, and flew off into the distance, knowing where he could start a new life, and help people break free of the cycle of hatred. Kirigakure, here I come. He thought as he put a dual connector on his MP3 player and put on some headphones on Shinny and himself. He then pressed play and smiled. Naruto had Shinny land in a patch of grass so he could set up camp. Shinny went to graze on grass as Naruto set up a tent and collected firewood, all the while unaware of a patrol of Yagura's forces watching him from afar. Later Naruto had eaten and fallen asleep with Shinny by the side of his tent. He was dreaming when he heard a poof and gained the memories of his dispelled shadow clone guard. There were approximately 15 shinobi outside trying to subdue Shinny. He wasn't having any of this as he got his shield, spear, and sword and donned his armor from Achilles. He then made five cage bunchons and ordered them to go into the forest to pick off anyone trying to flee. He then made two more cage bunchons and charged outside. Pav Yagura's forces they had just killed a man that rode in on a flying horse. They were on cloud nine. Surely Yagura would reward them for this find, right? The horse was fighting back though, and struggling. They never noticed five shadows slip past them into the woods. All they heard was a loud battle cry. Naruto Naruto charged the forces with his shadow clones. They had all channeled wind chakra into their spears and charged at the enemies. It was then that they noticed the men had tied Shinny down. Shit. I'll have to be more careful now. Naruto thought as he and his swords charged with a battle cry. Their shields covered their bodies as the enemy shinobi threw kanai and shuriken at them. As soon as they were near the enemy, Naruto and his clones started thrusting and swinging with their shields, careful to stay away from Shinny. 
The herd squelches as their spears ran through shoulders, stomachs, and more. It was then that a shinobi launched a huge water dragon at Naruto that he jumped. His clones were downed. Naruto grimaced as he wiped some of his blood on his tattoo while going through hand seals. The temperature dropped suddenly as he finished the chain and called Titan style, harshness of the winter storm. The whole place was blanketed in ice as hail started to rain down. But Naruto wasn't done as he cut Shinny free of his bindings. He then jumped on Shinny and had him fly upwards. He did more hand seals and cries Titan style, revenge of the bloody Yeti. As the snow started to swirl together, in seconds, the snow formed a clear Yeti made of ice. Its eyes were blood red, and its claws made a blood red snow. The Yeti the growled and started attacking barreling through shinobis like they were nothing. Naruto smirked and watched on as the yeti completely decimated their forces. All but one little piggy was left. The yeti had him in a full Nelson and was about to slam him against ice spikes when it heard a shout to stop. It looked to see its master looking at the enemy. The yeti nodded and dissolved, then reformed into an ice tree, binding the enemy shinobi. It was then that the interrogation would begin. One bloody interrogation later it had been a good interrogation. Apparently, there was a battle being fought in a concentration camp a couple of miles away. They were just supposed to get the horse and go back to help. He also got some roots for the army, but that was it. Nothing more did the lackey know. Naruto looked at the shinobi, wondering what to do. He nodded as the tree started to bind itself tighter to the enemy. It got tighter and tighter until a loud scream and a squelch was heard. The once clear ice tree had been stained red. Naruto looked at Shinny as he petted Shinny's head. Up for a fight boy? He asked. Shinny snorted and flew off in the direction of the camp as soon as his rider got on. The concentration camp Mei Terumi was not happy. Not happy at all. This was supposed to be a routine liberation. What no one told them was that instead of 30 shinobis in the camp, there were 300. Now Mei was a smart woman. She knew the 50 rebel shinobis she brought with her wouldn't be able to hold off the 300 enemy shinobis. They would soon be overpowered, but she wasn't going down without a fight. It was then, when a shadow was upon her, sword aimed at her throat, that she heard a yell. She looked to see the man behind her impaled on an ancient looking sword, being held by what could only be described as a hero. He wore a black chest piece, a black battle helmet that covered his sandy blonde hair his blue eyes visible, and a battle skirt. She fought back a blush as she saw more men come in dressed like him, all carrying swords, shields, and spears. She didn't know on which side they were on until they attacked the enemy shinobi, leaving her forces untouched. Naruto Naruto had an uneventful flight to the camp. But when he arrived, he saw a major fight going on. Ninja like the ones that attacked him were fighting against what appeared to be rebel forces. He saw one of the ninja was about to stab a woman with blood red hair, creamy white skin, beautiful features, solid blue lipstick. She wore a dark blue combat dress that showed a lot of cleavage and leg. He immediately jumped off Shinny and stabbed the enemy through the back, impaling him. He then gave the order and his clones, hanged as Achilles' army, charged forward. What then happened could only be described as a slaughter. Achilles' forces were precise and ruthless, killing with efficiency. They would all watch each other's backs, like true brothers in arms. When a jutsu was fired on them, they would form a metallic dome with their shields to protect themselves, and would then charge back into the fight. In Kenjutsu, she was sure these guys could take down the seven swordsmen of the mist no contest. They used every advantage they had, whether it was shield, spear, sword, or environment. She looked on as did her forces. When it was all said and done, the strange new arrivals hadn't lost any numbers, while Mei's had dwindled to 23. It was then that Mei walked up to Naruto and said I am Mei Terumi, leader of the rebellion against the bloodline purges in Kirigakure. And who are you? She asked. Naruto of Sparta he declared. That was when his clones started dispelling five at a time with a one minute interval in between. Mei was shocked when the literal army of 100 plus men all dispelled the original being the one in front of her. He looked at her face and smiled. What? Do I have something on my face? He asked. Everyone's sweat dropped. He then walked towards the camp. Where are you going? Mei asked. To free the prisoners. He replied. 
She looked at him suspiciously. Are you a bloodline user? She asked. No I am not. Then why help us? Because just because you're different doesn't mean we're not the same. We are all human, are we not? If I cut you and you cut me, do we both not bleed? If you are in pain or am I? Do we not feel it? Just because you have a bloodline, doesn't mean you're different. It just means that you have something no one else does. That you're unique, he said. She was shocked by his words. No one had ever put that point and worded it so perfectly. In the end, they were all the same. She bit her lip and nodded to her men as they went to free the prisoners. In the dungeons all of the prisoners had been freed by Naruto and the rebellion. All but one. A little girl was in a cell crying. She had been like that for two days, asking for her mother. When Naruto asked for her mother, all of the prisoners shook their heads sadly. Her mother had been killed for defying the prison camp's leader. Naruto picked up the little girl and carried her outside. When he walked towards Mei, the little girl was still in tears. Mei saw the girl and her face grew grim. Many kids had been made orphans because of the purges. She took the girl into her arms and comforted her, whispering kind words into the girl's ear. The girl finally relaxed and fell asleep. She was then handed to a kunoichi to be taken and checked over for injuries. Mei looked over at Naruto. He was sitting by a lake looking towards the moon. He then leaned back into the grass and looked at the stars. Mei walked towards him mind if I join you? She asked. He nodded and she sat down. She saw his hand moving and she looked up what are you doing? She asked. Tracing my clan symbol in its constellation he replied. She looked up to see his clan symbol, it looked like hell's gates, with skulls all over it. She looked at his armor and found the same symbol, and your clan is? The Spartan clan. Once a brave and powerful people, now dwindled to only one, me. He replied. She looked at him bloodline purges. She asked. Nope. Just too much war and hatred. That's why I got mad when I heard of this camp. I came to destroy it, but then realized if I went up against the main cause, I could stop this chain of hatred. He said. She was shocked and looked at him, her voice a whisper you really want to end this hatred? Why? You have no bloodline or family. Why risk it all? She asked. Because no one deserves to suffer for something they have no control over. He replied. She looked at him and smirked. Then how about joining up with the rebellion? We could use a one-man army like you. All we would have to do is test you to see where you would be best suited. He smiled sure. As long as I don't have to see another look like that little girl's ever again. He said. May could only look at him in shock as she felt her cheeks heat up. All of this for a non-selfish reason. I might have to get to know him better. She thought. He smiled as he got up and offered her a hand. Let's go, Mei Chan he said, Mei Chan? She thought as her blush grew and she took his hand. She got up and smiled. Little did he know this next one and a half years would be a new adventure. Time skip. One and a half years it had been one and a half years since Naruto joined the rebellion. He reminisced on how he got to be the captain of an all-out assault squad. Flashback an 18-year-old Naruto was being led to the rebellion's training grounds to be tested on where he would be best suited. He had to fight an opponent and see if he could beat them. The leaders would then evaluate him and place him accordingly. They put him up against their top shinobi, Mei Terumi. As Naruto approached the field, he saw her and smirked so you're my opponent, Ey Mei Chan? He asked. She nodded and took out a Tonto style blade. She got into position and looked at him do good on this, and I might give you a reward. She said with a wink. Naruto grinned as he grabbed his shield and his spear and looked at her. She charged him and tried to stab him, only for her tanto to break as soon as it hit his shield. She then pulled out another one and charged, only to have to dodge a spear stab and to be knocked down by the heavy shield. She growled and charged him. He smirked as he dropped his spear and unsheathed his sword. He swung and their swords met with a loud clang sound. He then set up his defense as she struck again, not even leaving a scratch. She then continued then onslaught, but his defense was impenetrable. That was when Naruto went on the offense, weaving an intricate web of steel maneuvers. Mei was having trouble keeping up. This style was unpredictable, consisting of slashes, thrusts, stabs, and more. Before she knew it, she was slammed into the ground and the sword was at her throat. She smiled and pushed him off, 
then began doing hand seals lava style, combusting smoke. She yelled as ash started to seep from her mouth, it rained on Naruto. Naruto then wiped some blood on his tattoo and did some hand seals titan style, magma's gift. He yelled. Magma seeped from the floor and surrounded him, protecting him from the ash. When she threw a fire jutsu into the ash, it exploded sky high. She was unsure if she hurt him, but her shock grew as she saw Magma surrounding him, protection him from the flames. He then did more hand seals and shouted titan style, Magma serpents. It was then that the magma around him took a snake-like shape and launched itself at Mei. It struck her on the gut and covered her completely, but since her affinity was magma, did no damage. In her magma prison, she heard faintly titan style, harshness of the winter storm. It was then that the magma started cooling too quickly. It soon became a rock and she had to use her lava release to bust herself out. She panted and looked at him you said you had no bloodline. She yelled. I don't. I have a pact with some, select individuals that in exchange for summoning them, I get to control their elements. But since I have all of the affinities, it's increasingly difficult for me to use ninjutsu. So I created a hybrid I call Titan Style. It allows me to use all of my elements to perfection, even thought I already mastered them. He replied. She looked at him in shock, but then turned around. Magma was more potent than lava since it remained hotter in the Earth's core. But instead of seeing a magma well, she saw a winter wonderland in her prison. She smirked and did more hand seals boil release, acidic mist. She yelled as mist was expelled from her body. She then lowered the pH level of it so it would completely corrode anything it touched. That was when Naruto did more hand seals titan style, angelic hurricane. That was when a tremendous amount of air began to form a hurricane. It sucked in May and her mist. By the time it was dispelled, he was too dizzy to even stand. Before she hit the floor, she felt something grab her. She looked to see Naruto grabbing her by the waist before she hit some ice spikes that would have killed her. He pulled her closer to him and she blushed as she felt his body pressed against hers. He landed on some snow and helped her up. What's next? He asked she responded by sending a kick to his face, which he caught and began to squeeze until he heard a snap. She then got on one foot and charged him. He kicked her legs out from under her and turned. He caught her face as she fell and with a quick twisting motion, knocked her out. Think RKO from WWE. Leaders to say they were shocked was an understatement. This man had just knocked out their strongest shinobi and made it look easy. They decided he would be a war general, but to which platoon he would get would be up to him. End flashback his platoon was Achilles' men. He smiled as he looked at Mei. She slept on his shoulder on the couch. Over the last year, they grew close. Flashback A 19-year-old Naruto was walking home from training when he saw a note on his tent. It was from Mei. She was inviting him over for dinner. It was a bit short notice, but he made it. When he got there, he realized she wasn't there. She must have gone shopping for groceries. He looked in her fridge and saw some chicken meat, some spices, some vegetables, and a bag of rice. He sweat dropped and got to work. May May was done shopping for groceries and was heading home when she heard some music in her house. She listened only to hear a song. Bon Jovi I want to be loved I had a roof overhead. Had shoes on my feet you sure I was fed but no one was there. When I was in need yay. So who am I now? Who do you want me to be? I can forgive you but I want relive you I ain't the same scared kid I used to be. I'm gonna live. I'm gonna survive. I don't want the world to pass me by. I want to dream I ain't gonna die thinking my life was just a lie. I want to be loved I want to be loved I found a picture. Our so-called family tree yay I broke all the branches. Looking for answers don't you know that ain't how. It's supposed to be? I'm gonna live I'm gonna survive. I don't want the world to pass me by I gonna dream. I ain't gonna die thinking my life was just a lie. I want to give I'm ready to try I'm willing to lay it on the line. I want to be loved. I want to be. I ain't gonna cry. I don't want to scream but I got so much left on set inside of me. I'm gonna live I'm gonna survive I don't want the world to pass me by. I'm gonna dream I ain't gonna die thinking my life was just a lie. I want to give I'm willing to try I'm willing to lay it on the line. I want to be loved. I want to be loved I just want to be loved. I want to be loved I want to be loved, she heard as the song faded away.
She walked in to see Naruto cooking a chicken stir fry and frying rice with chicken. She didn't know he could cook. She then looked at him, honey, I'm home, she joked. He looked up to see her with groceries in her hands and smiled. Sorry. I just thought you might like someone cooking for you for a change. He said. She nodded and looked at him. Why the sad song? I thought you liked your Spartan family, she asked. His smile dropped and he looked at her. The stir fry and chicken rice were done, so he set up the food for two and sat down. He poured her some red wine and himself some before he spoke. I'm not originally Spartan, but their blood does flow through me now and I think of myself as one. My original family was abusive. They treated me like crap, ordered attacks on me, and disowned me. All of this before I was even five. I lived in a brothel until a man I call my father found me. He and my brother sent me to the Spartan clan, where I was raised as one of them. I saw them all as my brothers and sisters, some even as parents. Then, they were all gone. All except my father and brother. They had to go off, so here I am, fighting a war, he said. She was shocked at this, but only asked why did they hate you so much Naruto? She asked. He sighed and turned from her, because I was the Jinchuriki for the Kayubi no Kitsune. My father in all but blood helped me kill it and I kept its chakra. But everyone in my village saw me as the fox, he said. Since he heard nothing, he turned and grabbed his blood red cloak. He put on his helmet and bowed, I'm sorry for the trouble. And thank you for the meal, Mei Sama, he said. He turned to leave, but only felt a warm embrace. He looked back to see Mei there. She looked up at him, tears spilling from her eyes, and spoke don't. Don't ever call me that. You have suffered through what I suffered, but you used it to get stronger. You were mistaken for the contained, and discriminated against. I was as well, but because of my bloodline. You understand me better than anyone, please, don't walk out of my life. She spoke sadly. He smiled and embraced her. He leaned down and kissed her forehead you mean, you don't care? He asked she smiled sadly and said no I don't, because of something a friend once told me. He said just because you're different doesn't mean we're not the same. We are all human, are we not? If I cut you and you cut me, do we both not bleed? If you are in pain or I am, do we not feel it? Just because you have a bloodline, doesn't mean you're different. It just means that you have something no one else does. That you're unique, she replied. He hugged her close to him, smiling in gratitude. Flashback end since then, he and May had gotten really close. So much so people mistook them for a couple. He smiled at the thought, but didn't want to push it with May. He didn't want to risk her friendship just because of a crush. On the bright side, the rebellion was winning. They had used guerrilla warfare tactics to systematically take down Yugura's forces. They had also ambushed various convoys with supplies and taken them for their own. They had completely ostracized Kiri from the world, and the war was winding down. They were almost done. All they needed was to take down Yugura. That was when a Chunin ran in leader Samas. Yugura and his entire army are on their way here, he said. All of the leaders were shocked, but only Naruto asked. How many? Approximately 20,000 shinobi, Chunin and higher, he exclaimed. Naruto only got up, took Mei to her bedroom and tucked her in. He had to prepare for a war. The next day Mei got up and reported to her station, only to hear they were preparing for war. She listened as Naruto told them to avoid crossing the barricade of rocks he made or that their lives were forfeit. She looked at the barricade and grimaced. This would barely help. What was he thinking? She then looked to see various rolls of chicken wire set up a bit past the no-mons land. She grimaced again. They looked to the top and saw stations for archers and beer barrels. They looked at Naruto incredulously, but kept on. He wasn't a leader for nothing. Naruto then left and told them to prepare. That by tonight Yagura's forces would be at the gates for a fight. He then left for the leader meeting, Mei following near him. Leader meeting the leaders were outraged when Naruto walked in you. Boy. What kind of war do you plan to fight with chicken wire, rocks, and beer? They asked. Naruto let it get out of their systems before he started explaining. The chicken wire, as you called it, are shadow clones that will explode when enough shinobi forces are around them. The rocks are only to mark what is hidden beneath the genjutsu I placed on the land. It is minor, so no one will expect it. 
There is a half a mile wide, 12 feet deep pool of magma that when shinobi enemies try to jump away from the exploding clones, they will jump into. It is also a sentient summon made of magma that has been told who to attack and who not to attack. Atop the archers are covering the beer barrels in oil and exploding tags. The archers will have flaming arrows that, when the barrels are rolled down towards the enemies, they will fire. The barrels will explode and cause massive damage. Then, any other shinobis can be picked off by the archers. That way, a good chunk of the army is taken out before our forces have to do any actual fighting. Yagura is mine though. Now if you will excuse me, I am weary and need some rest. Fighting a war will be, troublesome. He said as he left the leaders, including Mei, looking like idiots. Naruto's bedroom Naruto was lazily crawling into bed when he felt a pair of slender arms wrap around him. He turned to see Mei besides him. He smiled and laid down as she joined him, her still having all of her clothes on. She laid down on his side and smiled as an arm wrapped around her. Tomorrow will be war. I only hope I don't lose you Naruto-kun, she thought as she drifted off to sleep. That evening Naruto and Mei were woken up by a messenger that Yagura's forces were half an hour away. They both grimaced as they prepared for war. Naruto donned his Spartan elite armor, attaching the blood-red cape and leather underwear. He then grabbed his helmet and put it on, the only thing visible his cold blue eyes. Whenever he got into a fight, they looked icy blue. Almost as if though he was possessed, he grabbed his sword and sword sheath and equipped them. He then grabbed some olive oil and spread it throughout his arms, legs, and stomach. This was to prevent minor injuries and infection, or so his father had taught him. He then headed to the door, only stopping to see Mei already there, holding his shield and spear herself already prepared for war. He could only smile at how much she looked like Leonidas' wife when she bid him farewell. He quickly shook the thought and took his shield and spear. He strapped them on his back as they left towards the rock barricade. Rock barricade Naruto arrived at the barricade to see everyone tense as they awaited the battle. He looked at the temporary leader where are the refugees and non-combatants? He asked. They're concealed behind the archers so that in case the battle does not go our way, they can flee. The man replied. Naruto nodded and made an all too familiar hand seal. In seconds there was Achilles with 100 of his finest men, all donned in their jet black armor and ready for war. Naruto looked at Achilles and spoke I want you and your men to go up to where the refugees are and protect them with your life. If I find out even one of them was hurt, it shall be a stain upon your honor as a Spartan. Achilles only nodded and unsheathed his spear while equipping his shield. The rest of his men did the same as they headed to the rocky surface and walked up, using the chakra control exercise. Achilles looked at Naruto and nodded. Naruto then looked at the battlefield and shook his head. There were roughly 150 shinobis in good enough condition to fight. The rest were either sick or injured. He then closed his eyes and concentrated. Not a minute later various puffs of smoke were seen. Naruto looked up to see 300 of his clones hanged as the original 300 Spartans of legend. Leonidas and his second in command both walked up to Naruto. What are the odds, son? Leonidas asked. Naruto looked at his father as he bit into a peach. Not good father. They have near 20,000 shinobi and all we have are 150, 450 if you include you guys. Naruto then went on to explain the situation to Leonidas, who only smiled. Son, if the odds are that great, then why don't you even them out? He asked. Naruto was confused until he saw his father pointing at his arm. He looked to see his summoning tattoo and smiled. He then went to the front lines and wiped some blood on his tattoo. Immediately, hundreds of puffs of smoke could be seen. In those puffs of smoke were many legendary animals. From half man half horse like warriors to three women who would look no one in the face. Naruto grinned and looked at the 150 shinobi in his force. Men. These people shall be the equalizers in this struggle. The half-men half-horse warriors. He said pointing at the centaurs who wore silver armor, bearing a sword, shield, and spear, with the crest of hell's gates on them, will help solidify our main line of offense. And those three beautiful ladies, he pointed at the Gorgon sisters who wore purple dresses with the crest of hell's gates tattooed on their arms, will be our tipping point. They are known as the Gorgon Sisters. A gaze at any of their faces will turn a man to stone. They are also extremely skilled in the art of war. 
The females with the wings, he pointed at the harpies who wore white togas with the crest of Hell's Gates on them, will be an aerial support, offering assistance to any who need it. They are skilled in flying and with a sword. Their shriek can reduce even the strongest person into a quivering mess. As of right now, they are on the same level of authority as I am. They say jump, you don't ask how high, you jump and hope to God it's high enough, understood? Naruto was looking at his forces, waiting for a reaction, until one shinobi spoke up. Apparently, he wasn't scared of speaking his mind to monsters who made men cower in fear. He spoke up and said people, does our commander really expect us to fight next to? Two. To these things. I say nay. I don't care if this is our last hope for freedom, I refuse to fight next to these monsters. Ignoring the hurt look in the faces of the harpies and the gorgon sisters, he threw his forehead protector down, only to suddenly feel a sharp object at his throat. He looked up to see his commander only a couple of inches from beheading him. It was then that Naruto spoke do you truly believe that? That they are monsters because they look differently? You are a fool. No better than Yagura and his purge. These people, he said pointing to the summons, are the same as you and I. They are often discriminated against and hunted because of how they look. Of something they have no control over, he said sadly. Mei looked at him and was about to comfort him, when he raised his head. In his eyes burned a determination never seen before. Same as bloodline users have been, but they are my brothers and sisters. As are all bloodline users here. I feel as they have felt, I know as they have known. They are part of my family, of my clan, of Sparta, and I will not tolerate you belittling them. He yelled as he swung his sword, beheading the shinobi. He then looked out into the crowd and spoke any of you cowards want to leave, then leave. But we will fight. Even if the odds are against us, we will not crumple. We will fight. This morning, we ate heartily and if we shall fall on this night, tonight we will dine in hell. For glory. For our homes. For Sparta. He yelled as the 300 Spartans and the summons only raised their weapons and cheered Ha'u. 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 The shinobi were another story. Most were stunned. Their initial reaction was to fear and eliminate, but after having heard what Naruto said, they were stunned. Truth was, those monster, no, those people, were a lot like themselves. And the bloodline users had acted no better than Yugura's forces. They even went as far as to almost reject needed help because of their clouded judgment. Then they smiled and one soldier went up to Naruto. He bowed and spoke I am sorry for my actions, commander. I understand these people. I truly do. I wish only to fight next to them, to my brethren, for our home. He yelled. Naruto smiled and lifted him up. Then kneel not before me, brother. Rather, take your rightful place next to your family. He said. Many more shinobis bowed and stood next to the summons and the three hundred men. None others dared to leave their saviors, their fellow brothers in arms, their family. Minus five minutes later everyone was at their stations prepared for battle. The three Gorgon sisters and the centaurs were at the front lines with the three hundred warriors, the shinobis, and Naruto. Overall, their forces consisted of three hundred spartans, seventy centaurs, one hundred fifty shinobis, one hundred archers, three Gorgon sisters, and roughly a bit over forty harpies. The harpies were situated above with the archers so they could take off into the air easily and help the forces. Naruto, Leonidas, and Leonidas second in command, can't remember his name, so he's hum. Leo. Leo, were leading their forces. All of the forces were lined up a bit behind the blockade. That was when they heard a loud yell. Suddenly, hordes of shinobis came at them, running through the no-mons land. Naruto saw them getting closer and closer to the lake of magma, and whispered boom. Many shinobis near the hanged cage bunchons were blown apart, some at the legs, some at the arms, some at the waist. Those with enough combat reflexes immediately jumped forward, only to land in the magma lake. Their cries were the only things that were heard as they were incinerated. Some shinobis managed to get past both first lines of offense and charged forward. Drawing Kanai and Shuriken. Shuriken were thrown by the enemies at the back of the lines while the first lines of attack swung their Kanai, some Tonto and Katanas also. But all were brought to a sudden stop by a sudden wall of steel. Naruto had formed the phalanx defense with his 100 soldiers and the centaurs. He then screamed push. 
The shields were pushed forwards. The men then took their spears and stabbed ahead, then went back on the defense. With another yell of push, the same was done again. As the enemies swarmed the dome, Leonidas and his men looked onwards. He then yelled archers at the ready. Aim for your targets and fire. And with that, a shadow of black engulfed the dome as arrows rained down upon it, storming and impaling the enemy forces. Leonidas then put on his helmet and grabbed his spear. He looked at his men, then the archers. Archers, fire at will. Help friendlies and take down the enemy, he yelled as he jumped into the fray. His men soon followed after him, intent on helping their fellow brothers and their king. With Naruto and his company Naruto and his company were fighting with all they had. Naruto had thrown his spear and impaled an enemy shinobi through the gut when five more swarmed him. Before he could draw his sword, his father and Leo appeared and cut them all down. Leonidas turned to him keep your wits about you son. I will not lose you or any of the other men, he then jumped back into the fight. Naruto turned to see a shinobi charging him with a kunai. Naruto slammed his shield into the mon's face and impaled the man on his sword, then removed it and jumped forward. He looked forward and frowned, damn. Too many shinobi have crossed through. He whistled loudly and was responded by a loud shriek. The enemy shinobi crumpled as the shriek shattered their eardrums. Then they meet their dooms under the Spartan's onslaught. The harpies joined in, lending support to the centaurs by the air as the centaurs attacked the enemy. The centaurs would trample and gut their enemies and the harpies would distract their next prey. This was going well until a huge summon that looked like a crocodile appeared. The summon started to tear through the Spartans until Naruto had enough. He whistled to Shinny and jumped aboard, he went to the archers and got three of the beer barrels. They were all strapped to a harness that Shinny wore. The horse was having problems taking off, until two harpies came by and helped them lift the barrels. They then flew towards the crocodile. As soon as they were close enough, they unhooked the strap and watched as the barrels fell towards the crocodile. It was when the barrels were close to the crocodiles, various flaming arrows flew at it. The arrows struck the exploding tags attached to the barrels. Soon after, a huge explosion was heard. The blast struck the crocodile's face and it was forced to return to the summon's world. As Naruto landed back in the battlefield, the battle had shifted in the favor of Yagura's forces. He then bit his thumb and wiped blood over his tattoo. He went through a long chain of hand seals and yelled Titan's style, awakening of the magma serpent. Almost as if on cue, a serpent rose from the magma. It had no discernible face, but attached to its body were tentacle like magma snakes. The serpent made of magma then started charging at the enemy shinobi. Any of the shinobi dumb enough to charge at it were soon cut down. Mei then appeared next to the serpent. She was looking worse for wear, but not by much. Three shinobi were about to charge her when a water dragon came out of nowhere and struck the serpent and Mei. Mei was thrown back into the serpent, but instead hit solid rock. She looked to see the now rock serpent immobilized. She then turned and her worst fear came true. Yagura was there, he himself had joined the battle. She had summoned lava at her feet, only for it to turn to rock as Yagura doused it with a water ball. She knew she was done. Naruto Naruto was fighting against enemy shinobis when he turned to see a man douse his magma serpent with a water dragon. He saw him approach Mei. She tried to summon lava with another jutsu, only for it to be turned to rock at her feet. She was immobilized. The man then unsheathed a sword and approached Mei. No. I can't lose her. Naruto thought as he ran towards the man, but wasn't fast enough. He dropped his shield and sped up, getting closer and closer. Almost there, he thought as the man thrusted his sword toward Mei's chest. Mei Yugura had unsheathed his sword and went in for the kill, aiming at her heart. Her last thought was, I'm sorry about leaving you here alone, Naruto-kun. She waited for the feeling of cold metal piercing her heart, but it never came. Instead, a warm liquid was spilled on her face. She opened her eyes to see a blood red cape in from of her, a sword going through its side. She looked up to see Naruto punch Yagura in the gut, throw two jabs in his side, then kick him away. The Spartans swiftly formed the dome of metal as Naruto took time to heal. He turned to her as he removed the sword. She could only watch in astonishment as Naruto gained a faint yellow glow, his wound closing in the blink of an eye. She then looked at him and spoke, why? 
Why would you risk it all, for me? She asked. He frowned, but then spoke. People do crazy things, when they're in love. She could only stare as he helped her up. The Spartan's defense was holding up, but not for long. Naruto only grabbed his shield from the floor and looked at Mei. No matter what happens, Yagura is out of your life for good. That much I can promise you. The defense then dissolved as he jumped away, following Yagura. A mile away Naruto arrived at a huge lake with ice-cold water. He looked around to see Yagura as a pale green cloak of chakra overtook him. From the cloak sprouted three tails, and the three-tailed turtle was formed. It was massive, only able to wade in the lake it was in. It looked angrily at Naruto and spoke you. You have been the one causing me all of the problems. You helped those scum. Flea mortal. You do not deserve to be in my presence. You couldn't even scratch my shell. Naruto looked and started laughing. He then looked at the massive turtle and spoke flea? Flea? Spartans are thought never to flee and to always fight for their home. I will not abandon my brothers, no matter what, he yelled as he wiped some blood on his tattoo and channeled as much chakra as he could. He slammed his hands on the floor and a huge puff of smoke appeared. From that puff of smoke the earth started to shake violently. This caused the turtle like Biju to levitate off the floor. The earth shaking caused a huge crack on the earth to form. From that crack magma started to form. From the lowest depths of the earth, arise Titan of Magma. He yelled as the lava started to take shape. It was about as big as the turtle Biju, with hands that dripped magma. Its face had glowing yellow eyes as it frowned. That was when Naruto landed on its head and spoke Titan of Magma, will you lend me your strength in this fight? He asked. The Magma Titan only responded by opening its jaw and firing a magma shot at the giant turtle with three tails. The turtle then moved away and fired a water shot at the monster, only for a wall of magma to rise up and protect the monsters. The magma then evaporated the water and flew off at the turtle, its shape shifting to be what looked like magma spears. The turtle fired water at the spears, the spears being turned to stone and falling onto the ground. The magma titan then launched itself at the turtle, swinging its fist at the turtle. The turtle retracted into its shell and sent its tails out to impale the monster, only for the tails to be burned and the creature to shriek in pain. The turtle then looked at Naruto with eyes that seemed to scream for blood. A full chakra tail disappeared into balls of black and blue chakra. The balls then started to pull together and compress. Naruto watched as the ball of fully black chakra was swallowed by the turtle like Biju. Naruto then looked at the turtle and yelled now. The titan then sunk back into its crevice and was dissummoned. Naruto then swiped blood on his tattoo and did hand seals, then exclaimed titan style, hell's gates. Suddenly, doors over fifty feet tall arose from the they were shut, reeking a stench of death and decay. They had no decoration or colors, only a skull in the middle of them. It was then that the biju ball was fired, slamming against the doors. This was the scene Mei arrived to. She had cleared her leaving the battle with Leonidas since the waves of enemy shinobis had been stopped. He had allowed her to go check on how Naruto was. When she arrived, she saw Yugura forming what seemed to be a pure ball of chakra and swallowing it whole. She turned to see Naruto as he summoned some jet black solid gates. They literally reeked of death and hopelessness, her instincts telling her to get as far away from that gate as possible. She jumped up into a tree as the ball of chakra that Yugura swallowed fired a beam of pure chakra at Naruto, the blast slamming against the gate. She yelled out as she saw the blast hit the gates, worry for Naruto's health forming at the pit of her stomach. As the blast stopped and the smoke cleared, all that was seen was the gates still standing and a loud growl. Naruto stood behind the gates, the blast barely having scorched them. That was when he heard what he was hoping for, a loud growl. Then, the doors were slammed open as a huge black dog with three heads charged out in the open. It looked at the turtle Biju and snarled, You dare attack the gates of hell? You will pay for your impudence. It was then that Naruto climbed on top of the middle head and looked at Cerberus. Cerberus, I am the one that summoned hell's gates. I needed protection against an attack. Will you help me defeat this opponent? The guard dog of Hell's Gates snarled in response that thing attacked Hell's Gates. It will die. The dog then charged at the turtle at incredible speeds, dodging and ducking water blasts sent at it. 
Cerberus then jumped upwards and slammed its body into the turtle, effectively grounding it. The dog's three heads started attacking, biting whatever they could. One head latched onto a shoulder, the other to the turtle's neck, and the last one managed to grab the turtle's remaining tails into its mouth. They then pulled apart in an attempt to tear the turtle apart. A loud shriek was heard as another tail was pulled off, leaving the turtle with only one tail. Naruto took this as a needed chance and did hand seals, then slammed his hands onto the ground. With two loud poofs, two beings were summoned. One was a crawling magma monster and the other was a walking ice mountain. Naruto then did more hand seals and exclaimed Titan style, imprisonment of the damned. The lava monster then spewed huge amounts of magma at the turtle, making it shriek in pain as it was cooked alive. It was then that the ice monster started to blast the magma-soaked turtle with an ice attack, freezing the magma into solid rock. The creature let out a loud shriek as it was turned into a life-size turtle statue. Cerberus then jumped on it, its paws covered in hellfire. The hellfire broke the statue completely. The turtle's chakra receded as Yagura's body fell to the earth, landing on a huge pile of rocks. The body looked battered and bruised as it landed. Yagura opened his eyes to see a man in a blood-red cape holding a shield and sword standing over him. Yagura tried to move his body. It was no good. The Yuki had damaged it too much, the lava cooked it alive, and the rock killed off the skin. He was in death's cold embrace. As he faded into death, the turtle did as well. With no new host, it would die. Yagura's only comfort was that he died in battle. Naruto walked over to Yagura's body and checked the pulse. He was dead. Naruto then took two coins from his pouch and laid them on Yugura's eyes. His fairy money for sticks. Naruto had a feeling Yugura needed it more than he did. Naruto then picked up the body and headed back towards the fight. At least, he would have had his legs not buckled on him. He then remembered he had summoned a lot of creatures and the titans, it massively told his reserves. Even if he did have almost infinite chakra, today had left him with a severe case of chakra exhaustion. As he faded into unconsciousness, all he heard was his name being called in a mop of red hair. A week later Naruto awoke in a hospital room. He tried to get up, only to feel a weight on his side. He turned to see Mei asleep by his side. He smiled and proceeded to wake her up. He leaned close to her and whispered, Mei-chan? Mei-chan wake up. He said. He watched as her eyes slowly opened, only to grab a pillow and cover her face with it. Five more minutes, she said. He smiled and kissed her hand, then pulled her close to him. As soon as she felt his body under her, her eyes fluttered open. She looked down in cerulean blue eyes, blushing madly. She quickly jumped off Naruto and landed on the floor. Naruto got up and picked her up. He looked at her and asked so how did the battle go? Did we win? Is it over? He asked. She nodded and spoke yes. Yagura is dead. The battle was won with the help of your summons, and as of now, the bloodline purges are over. She said happily, she looked up at him and started. Well, Spartan, apparently, your victory has spread throughout all of the elemental nations. Various reports have come in from our patrols stating that bloodline users are starting to come back into Kiri. Also, the rowdy normal civilians and shinobis have been quelled and have come to accept the bloodline users. How? Why? He asked. She smiled and responded because Yagura was spending over 75% of the village's resources and money to fight the purge, so the civilians and shinobi joined our side. They already sympathized with us, but the major economic shift pushed them to our side. As of now, all we need is a new Mizukage, although there is one slight problem. She said in a worried tone. Naruto looked at her and asked what is it? Everyone wants Yagura to be succeeded by whoever defeated him. And the bloodline users have been spreading stories about your feats, so much that the shinobi and villagers have been calling you the Crimson Spartan, and the non combatant bloodline users speak of their defenders, an army of dark deaths. She said. Naruto looked at her, but shook his head. Wait, you can't mean, no, not me, he said while shaking his head. She smiled and nodded, yep, they want you to be the Mizukage. She said. Naruto looked at her and spoke well. First let me recover and then we will see, okay? I might not be able to take up the mantle because I want to go out and search for Kiri bloodline users and to reunite the seven swordsmen of the mist. 
If anyone deserves it, it should be you. You organized the rebellion and fought through hell before I came along. He said as she blushed. She then got up and before leaving, turned and spoke I'll see you later, Naruto-kun. It has been a week since the rebellion had beaten out Yugura's forces. In that week, various missives came seeking an alliance with the newly formed Kiri. Most with small villages were accepted because of food lines and medial supplies. The hidden villages missives all had been declined. Especially the one from Konoha. But today was a day of new beginnings. This is why we find Naruto rushing to put on his Spartan armor from Achilles. A couple of days ago, he had asked Mei out on a date, and she had said yes. Naruto was putting on the rest of his jet black armor when something jolted him. Shit. I have nothing planned, he thought. He quickly summoned two shadow clones and had them go set up the most romantic date they could. Naruto then sealed his weapons and helmet into the seals on his arms. Even if he was home, there was no guarantee he was safe. He then walked out of his home and walked towards Mei's. He was already late, so he decided to cut through the red light district. He was running when he suddenly stopped. He turned and saw a small seven-year-old girl with raven hair crying next to an old lady who was being pushed out of a store. Naruto walked up to the store only to see that the old lady didn't have enough to pay her groceries with. He looked at the old lady and the girl and walked in. He was already recognized through Kiri as their savior. He walked up to the counter and spoke excuse me, are these the groceries those people were gonna buy? He asked, and the clerk nodded. Yay, but the lady only had six dollars and that is worth thirty-five dollars the man replied. Naruto nodded his head and pulled out thirty-five dollars. He then picked up the groceries and spoke if that lady comes back and tries to buy something, don't charge her. Send the bill to my house, and I will pay. Do we have a deal, shopkeeper? He asked. The shopkeeper only nodded as Naruto left. He spotted the old lady pushing the little girl on a swing and walked by, listening in on their conversation. Well Sakuya, I'm sorry we can't eat again. I know you're hungry, but I can't afford it. Tell you what, though. Soon, I'll buy you any treat you want, okay? The old lady asked. The little girl only nodded and kept swinging. Naruto then approached them and handed the bags to the old lady excuse me, ma'am, but I believe these are yours. He said. The old lady looked in the bag to find her groceries and a large wad of money. She looked at the man who swung her granddaughter on the swing and spoke why are you doing this? In a wary voice. Naruto only shrugged. You guys need it. And I will not stand to see a little girl or an elder go hungry. When you go to the store, the clerk will not charge you. I'll take care of the bill, okay. Tell me if he tries to charge you so I can pay him a visit. He said. Sakuya was still swinging when Naruto walked off. The old lady asked who are you? I'm Naruto. Naruto of Sparta. He replied as he ran off to Mei's house. Mei was a patient woman, but her date was already 20 minutes late. She was about to go back in her house when a yellow blur shot into her front yard. I'm not late, am I? He asked as he tried to catch his breath. He was treated to a glare by Mei. He looked on and spoke sorry. I had to help an old lady buy groceries. May Sweat dropped and looked at him. I don't believe you she said. She was about to start yelling at him for being late when a young girl about seven came up to him. She hugged him and said thank you mister. She then turned around and walked off to the entrance, where an old lady was waiting for her with an arm full of groceries. She shrugged and looked at him. I guess you were telling the truth. Naruto nodded and smiled. He bit his thumb and wiped it on his tattoo. In a cloud of smoke, Shinny appeared. He flapped his wings as Mei looked at him. What are you thinking Naruto? She asked. Naruto smirked as he pointed at Shinny. Your steed awaits, my lady. He said. She hesitantly climbed up, then Naruto climbed up behind her. She leaned back into his arms as he took the reins. She thought, hum, a horse ride, this will be nice. When Shinny broke out in a mad dash. He then unfurled his wings and she looked scared, he was heading straight for a cliff. She closed her eyes as he jumped, only to feel a cool breeze on her face. She opened her eyes to see they were flying over the ocean around Kiri's borders, as free as a bird. She slowly got up and saw fishermen's boats staring up at them and small coast towns where children were playing. 
she looked up at Naruto and saw his eyes closed as he enjoyed the breeze on his face. She closed her eyes and felt the weightlessness around her, the warm sun on her face, and the feeling. That unknown feeling to her. The feeling of being, free. Of being able to go wherever you want. She smiled and thought, this isn't so bad. I can see why he loves flying. She then leaned back into his body and rested her head on his chest, smiling at the feeling. She then felt the horse drop and saw where they were going. It was a clearing near the village. It was hidden beneath countless trees, but it was there. As Shinny landed, Naruto grabbed her bridal style and got off the horse, carrying her to the clearing. There was a table and a small feast waiting for them. There was steamed rice, beef with broccoli, some sweet and spicy chicken, and a big pot. She was unsure of what was in the pot, but then he opened it and grinned. He went to her side and bowed. My lady, may I escort you to your meal? He asked playfully. She smirked and took his hand as he led her to a table with a blood red cover, candles in the center, plates set up, and a bucket with a white handkerchief covering it. She slowly took her seat as Naruto unveiled the bucket. There sat a bottle of red wine, chilled, and he opened it. He filled her glass and his and took his seat. He then made a shadow clone to serve them, the clone coming back with two bowls of rice, two plates with beef and broccoli and sweet and spicy chicken, and finally a bowl full of ramen. Naruto dismissed the clone and looked at Mei. She then spoke happily so how can you stand it? She asked. Stand what? Having to come back to earth after flying. She responded. Naruto smiled well I have to eat, don't I? And besides, if I never came to the ground then I wouldn't get to see you. And that wouldn't be fair to me, he said. How so? She asked. Well tell me, if one day you woke up and you didn't see the sun, would you care? Of course I would. It wouldn't feel the same, she replied. Exactly. If I don't see you, my day doesn't feel the same. Like something's missing, he said as he chewed on some chicken. She blushed and looked at him really. Yeah. That's why I always make time to just hang out with you, no matter what. He replied. She blushed and looked down as he looked at her. You know, you're cute when you blush he said. Mei then looked up at him and spoke Naruto, when you said what you said. Did you mean it or was it a heat of the moment statement? When I said what, Mei Chan? He asked. She sighed, this guy was so thick headed. When you said that people do crazy things, when they're in love she finished with a small blush on her face. He looked at her yes. Yay I did. But I wasn't sure if you felt the same. And even if you did, there is still a lot of my life you don't know about. Her response was to frown, but her resolve was solid. After nearly losing him at the hands of Yugura, she wanted to know the man who had captivated her heart. Then tell me she replied. He frowned and looked at her I'm. I'm afraid. He replied. Afraid of what? She asked. Afraid that once you get to know my past, that you won't like me anymore. He replied. Her only response was to cup his cheek in her hand and kiss him, a short, chaste kiss. But that kiss was the world to him, it showed him that she cared for him. He then stood up and took out what looked like a metal flask. It had the insignia of Hell's Gates, he poured a clear looking liquor into a small sake cup and handed it to her. This is a special liquor, it has all of my memories instilled in it. If you want to know of my past, take the sip, he said. She looked at him, then the cup. Seems a bit far wretched, don't you think? She asked. We're ninja. We stick to walls, walk on water, and summon talking animals. Normal and far-fetched shouldn't be in our dictionary. She nodded. He had a point. And if this was what she needed to get to know the real him, then she'd do it. She took the sake saucer and sipped it suddenly, her vision blurring as soon as she swallowed the drink. She fell unconscious. Naruto sighed as he made clones to clean up the food and picked Mei's body up bridal style. He carried her back to his apartment and laid her on his bed. He could only wonder what she would think of him after seeing all of his battled in lives. For once, he was worried of what someone would think of him. In May's mindscape, May stood in front of some dark looking gates, the gates reeking of death and decay. They had the symbol of Hell's gates on them, but she didn't care. She pushed forward and a stream of memories came at her. She witnessed Naruto's first five years of his life with Anko, Ayame, and Hana. She witnessed his horrible childhood and the very night that Hades came to save him. 
She saw him being trained under his three legendary teachers, his one night with Cynthia, him fighting with the 300 legendary Spartans and his death. She smiled at his pride in his son and his lover, she witnessed him training with Achilles, his scheme to help save Achilles' life, and his ultimate death at the hands of Sparta's king. She saw him as he started to see Hades, the god of death, as his father and the Shinigami as his brother. She then witnessed him as he was trained by the demigod Hercules. She saw him fighting the Titans, his inner conflict at facing his father figure, his joy when he received Shinny, and his ultimate ascension into godhood. She was shocked by this, but it did explain his healing factor. She finally witnessed as he gained control of the Titans, and saw his final goodbye to Cynthia. She then witnessed his training with the Shinigami, the birth of his ninjutsu style, and his constant training to improve. The scenes then faded and focused on a specific timeline. It was when he first met her in the battle to liberate the Bloodline users. She felt what he felt when he first saw the little girl without her mother, she felt what he felt when he joined the rebellion. She smiled sadly at the memory of him cooking for her, how he felt close and closer to her, but was afraid to lose her, so he said nothing. She smiled at the warm feeling she felt when she saw his true feelings. She smiled and her heart finally decided on her choice as she saw him handling the situation with the old lady and the little girl. He's good with kids. Then the gates were shut close. May felt her eyes getting droopy. The last thing she heard was a feminine voice saying take care of him. May woke up late in the evening. She heard sounds coming from a kitchen. She wiped the sleep from her eyes and saw she was in Naruto's apartment, sleeping on his bed curled up with a pillow. She got up and walked outside, following down a hall to where she saw light and voices. She stumbled and saw three Naruto's in the kitchen cooking and four of them playing poker on the table. Well that gives, playing with yourself, a new definition. She said. The clones heard her and turned around laughing. That was when three Naruto's came in and set up the table to eat as the original dispelled his poker buddies. The cooks then dispelled, leaving Naruto and Mei alone. Naruto pulled out a chair and let Mei sit before he himself took a seat. He then grabbed a fork and dug into the food. So how was your sleep? He asked. She looked at him and responded pretty good. Saw all of your life. She responded ironically. He looked down at the food and what do you think of me now? He asked. She just got up, went to his side, and kissed him fully on the lips. His eyes were wide with shock, but he sank into it and kissed her back, pulling her onto his lap. She broke the kiss and looked at him that answer your question? Yay. Dot but why? Don't you think of me as a monster? I have killed more men than anyone in their lives can say. Her only response was to bring him face to face yay but you did it to protect your land and those close to you. If you had done it senselessly, I would have thought differently, but you did it because it had to be done. She then looked at the clock and saw it was already 1 am she took his hand and led him to the bed. Where are we going? To sleep. I'm tired. We can discuss what I say in the morning, okay. For now, you just need to know that what I feel for you is real. After seeing all that you have had to go through, I can honestly say you're the man I want to be with. You're everything I've hoped for out of a man. Kind, caring, strong, good with kids. You understand my needs and wants. You try your best to help whenever you can. I don't care if you have soiled your hands, I want to be there for you. I'll help you clean them, I promise. She said as she snuggled into his chest. He smiled and hugged her close to him, a simple thought coming to mind. I'm never letting you go. No matter what, he thought as he drifted to sleep. It was early in the morning when Naruto was awoken by a knocking on his door. He tried to get up, only to hear a voice five more minutes. He looked to see Mei on his chest and smiled as her ran his fingers through her hair. Mei Chan, there's someone at the door he whispered in her ear. She slowly got up and headed to the door, grumbling about people being too damn early. She got to the door and opened it, only to find a Chunin there. I have a message for Naruto-sama he said in a dull tone. Mei called Naruto and he got to the door. The messenger then gave him a scroll and saluted as he disappeared. Naruto unrolled the scroll, read it, and frowned. Mei looked over his shoulder and pulled him close to her. What's wrong Naru-kun? Zabuza and the Demon Brothers have been spotted near Wave Country. Looks like I'm taking a field trip, he said as he went to pack. Mei smiled and looked at the helmet on the kitchen table, 
He might act like he doesn't care, but he does, on the inside, she thought as she headed to the kitchen. Might as well send him off with something in his stomach, and I wonder if there's a tailor that can make me a Spartan dress like that Leonidas wife. She whispered to herself as she started frying eggs. Half an hour later, Naruto came out to the kitchen. He had taken a shower and put on his golden brown armor given to him by Hercules. Brown chest piece and back piece, a battle skirt, his leather underwear, a small red cape attached to the back. He had all of his weapons sealed into his arms and important documents too. He looked around and smelled something delicious. He walked over to the kitchen and saw Mei there already eating breakfast. She smiled can't send the man I love out with an empty stomach, can I? She asked. He smiled and started eating. I like the sound of that. Love, he thought as he finished eating. He went over to Mei and kissed her passionately, pulling her close to him as he wrapped his arms around her. She eagerly returned the kiss and wrapped her arms around his neck. She smiled as he broke the kiss off what was that for? For being there for me and loving me, no matter what he replied. She smiled and followed him outside, keeping her eye on him as he saddled Shinny and got everything ready. He led the flying horse outside and was about to get on, when he was turned to kiss Mei. He wrapped his arms around her and kissed back. After two minutes, they broke off, the need of air having gotten to them. She looked at him, a blush on her face be careful out there, you hear? If you die, it'll bring you back to life just to kick your ass myself he smiled as he climbed on Shinny love you too he said as Shinny took off. Mei waved goodbye to him and suddenly had a large grin on her face that would have made the cat from Alice in Wonderland proud. Oh, Naru kun When we get back, I guarantee you'll be surprised, she thought as she looked at his crappy home. Naruto took out his MP3 player and put the earphones on. He pressed play and smiled, leaning back into the saddle as Shinny flew towards Wave. He listened to You're Gonna Go Far Kid by The Offspring, Unforgiven 2 by Metallica, and Rock You Like a Hurricane by The Scorpions, I own none of the songs, so you know. Dot yay. At the start of Pour Some Sugar on Me by Def Leppard, he turned it off and sealed it back in his arm. He told Shinny to slow down as he saw five people walking on an unfinished bridge. One was a silver-haired man with his face stuck in an orange book, a kid with a duck-assed hairstyle, a girl whose pink hair screamed open season, a burly old man who looked like hell, and finally, a pale-skinned kid with an extremely eerie smile. He looked at them and laughed. The pale kid had some skills, that much he could tell. But the rest were a joke. Even the scarecrow hadn't noticed his presence, he decided to follow them, then saw the duck asked Emo throw a kanai at a bush. He saw the pale kid go to the bush and come back holding a rabbit. Nice job Dickless, you protected us from a vegetarian. Was his comment. Naruto laughed quietly, until he heard a loud whizzing sound through the air. He looked to see a large blade flying at the ninja and the old man. He decided to wait and watch as the fight went on. The kids all froze horribly except the pale one who drew a lion that came to life. The emo almost went as far as committing suicide, but was stopped by the scarecrow. The scarecrow then unveiled his eye to show a Sharingan. So Sharingan no Kakashi, eh? Things just got interesting. Naruto thought as he saw Zabuza and Kakashi going at it. When Zabuza had caught Kakashi in his water prison, it was over. It was time for Naruto to act. Naruto was listening to Zabuza talk to the genin when he jumped from Shinny. He landed on the water with a crouch and a puff of smoke surrounded him. As the smoke cleared, Naruto held his shield and sword ready. Zabuza Momoichi, the Mizukage has sent me to make you a deal. He announced as he got up. I want make a deal with that bastard Yagura. Zabuza yelled as he charged at Naruto, having told a clone to take his place at the prison, his large blade in him swing. Naruto jumped over the blade and swung his sword downwards, but missed. Zabuza jumped back and looked at the new warrior, his blade and then himself. Well, finally someone who isn't all talk. Tell me kid, where did you get that blade? He asked as he poised himself for an attack. My father gave it to me after I was trained. Naruto said as he prepared his shield for defense. The symbol on the shield didn't matter to Zabuza, but it did to Kakashi. No way, a report said a man with the same shield was the one to beat Yugura the three-tailed Jinchuriki. He thought as he saw Zabuza charge. Zabuza swung his sword and thought it would shred through the shield, 
only for the shield to stand. Naruto the stabbed at Zabuza's shoulder, barely making a cut. Zabuza then jumped back and started making hand seals. Naruto recognized the seals and jumped back, wiping blood on his tattoo and doing hand seals. Zabuza finished and yelled as a huge water dragon charged at Naruto, full speed. Naruto then finished his chain seals and yelled Titan style, harshness of the winter storm. The temperature then suddenly dropped, the water dragon freezing mid-air and falling down with a thud. Zabuza was in shock, as was Haku in the trees, is he like Haku? Zabuza thought, Haku wondering the same thing. Kakashi watched on from his prison, wondering why he couldn't copy the jutsu. Naruto poured more chakra, grinning as the water in the lake and the water prison froze over. Zabuza then did more hand seals and called out water style, water bullet. Only to see nothing happened. He looked to see all of the water frozen, even his water clones. He charged Naruto onwards again, only to feel a sharp sting on his neck as the world went black. Haku noticed her master was at a serious disadvantage and decided a tactical retreat was in order. She threw Senbon needles at him, aiming at his neck to put him in a death-like state. She then dropped down. Thank you. I have been hunting him for a long time. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have caught him, she said as she picked up the body and disappeared. Naruto then went over to the huge ball of ice and struck it with his sword, cutting it open. Kakashi popped out, watching the stranger carefully. Naruto then turned and saw the emo kid trying to get on top of Shinny, the horse amusing himself by kicking the emo whenever he got too close. That was when he heard words that got him pissed. He turned to see Kakashi tell the old man that they didn't have to continue the mission and turned to leave. The man, whose name was Tazuna, was on his knees begging, but it didn't matter, the Konoha scum had decided to head back. Kakashi then looked at the oddly dressed man and spoke and what is your name, stranger? He asked. Naruto. Naruto of Sparta. Naruto replied, smirking as he saw recognition flash through Kakashi's eye. Kakashi then pulled out a kanai and looked at Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, by order of the Sandame and Kashina Uzumaki Namikaze, you are to be brought back to the village. Surrender or we will take you by force. Naruto laughed loudly, then turned and looked at Kakashi. That, woman and her husband disowned me when I was a little kid, and now she wants me back? Hell no I hold no allegiance to her nor that wretched hellhole. He said. Kakashi then bit his thumb and did hand signs, slamming his hands on the ground. Naruto jumped back and a larger puff of smoke was seen. When the smoke cleared, there stood over fifty warriors, all being led by Naruto and another man. On Kakashi's side there were roughly thirty nin dogs, being led by an ugly ass pug. Naruto the prepared himself, as did all of the warriors. Then Kakashi heard a loud yell. His three students had been captured by men wearing jet black armor. Naruto and a man with black hair, a black beard, and more scars than Kakashi could count, walked up. Kakashi, now you know even you can't take down this many men. You're outnumbered and low on chakra. Leave this place with your weak excuses for students and we will not attack. Naruto said. Kakashi gritted his teeth, but nodded. He was then escorted to land by the warriors. Kakashi then summoned a messenger hawk. He had to get these news back to Konoha ASAP. Naruto and Tazuna were walking back to Tazuna's house. After the Konoha Nin left, Naruto agreed to protect the bridge builder. They arrived on what looked to be an inn. Tazuna knocked and a beautiful woman answered the door. Yes? Oh father, you have returned, she said happily as she hugged the old man. Naruto smiled at the scene, but was snapped back as Tazuna introduced him, well kinda. Yay. And here is the ninja I hired to protect me, he exclaimed happily as he pointed at Naruto. Naruto bowed thank you for allowing me in your beautiful house, Tsunami-san he said as he walked in. Are there any fields near here? My horse could use a rest. He said as Shinny whinied. Tsunami saw the horse and nodded, leading it to an old barn in the back. She led Shinny to an old stall and kept him get settled, only to gasp as the horse unfurled its wings and curled up on its bed. She then ran back to the house. When she got there, she saw Tazuna drinking and Naruto giving orders to three other men. One only wore leather underwear, a crimson cape, jet black sandals, and a helmet. Brown eyes, black
black hair, and a beard were visible through the helmet. The other wore full chest armor, a battle skirt, sandals, and a helmet, all in a jet black finish. Sandy blonde hair and blue eyes were seen through the helmet, and the final had full ankle sandals, full chest armor and a battle skirt in a tan brown color, and a blue cape attached to its back. His brown hair and blue eyes, can't remember, so sorry, were visible. Tsunami blushed and looked down as Hercules smiled at her. Tazuna looked at Naruto and asked who were they. Your security detail Naruto replied as he went out to train. To be continued. I hope you enjoyed. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.